Governor's Executive Order N2920 and the 12th Supplement to Mayoral Proclamation declaring the existence of a local emergency dated February 25th, 2020. Before we proceed further, I would like to ask Commission Staff Member Ronald Contreras, who is acting as our moderator, to explain some procedures for today's remote meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Chu. The, meeting, the minutes of this meeting will reflect that due to the COVID-19 health emergency and to protect Commission members, city employees, and the public, the meeting rooms of City Hall are closed. However, Commission members and staff will be participating in today's meeting remotely. This precaution is taken pursuant to the various local, state, federal orders, declarations, and directives. Commission members will attend the meeting through video conference and participate in the meeting to the same extent as if they were physically present. Please know that today's meeting is being live cablecast on SFGov TV and streamed live online at sfgovtv.org backslash ethics live. Once again, streamed live online at sfgovtv.org backslash ethics live. Public comment will be available on each item on this agenda. Each member of the public will be allowed three minutes to speak. Comments or opportunities to speak during the public comment period are available via phone call by calling one 415 655-0001. Again, the phone number is 1-415-655-0001. Access code is 2485-128-0118. Again, the access code is 2485-128-0118, followed by the pound sign. Then press pound again to join as an attendee. You'll hear a beep when you are connected to the meeting. You will, automatic, you will be automatically muted and in listening mode only. When your item of interest comes up, dial star three to raise your hand to be added to the public comment line. You will then hear, you have raised your hand to ask a question. Please wait until the host calls on you. The line will be silent as you wait your turn to speak. Ensure that you are in a quiet location. Before you speak, mute the sound of any equipment around you, including television, radio, or computer. It is especially important that you mute your computer if you are watching via the web link to prevent feedback and echo when you speak. When the system message says your line has been unmuted, this is your turn to speak. You will hear staff say, welcome caller. We encourage you to state your name clearly. As soon as you begin speaking, you will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. You'll hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you have changed your mind and wish to withdraw yourself from the public comment line, press star three again. You will hear the system say, you have lowered your hand. Once your three minutes has expired, staff will thank you and mute you. You will hear your line has been muted. Attendees who wish to speak during other public comment periods may stay on the line and listen for the next public comment opportunity and should raise their hands to enter the public comment line by pressing star three when their next item of interest comes up. Public comment may be also submitted in writing and will be shared with the commission after this meeting has concluded and will be included as part of the official meeting file. Written comments should be sent to ethics.commission at sfgov.org. Once again, written comments should be sent to ethics.commission at sfgov.org. Thank you, Commissioner Chu. Have we resolved uh, the technical difficulties with Chair Lee? Uh, we're, let me see if she's. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, yay. Good uh, morning. Yay. Success. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everybody. My apologies, especially to our newest member, Commissioner Sinos. This is usually not the way we start our meetings, but um every day is an adventure uh for for um this commission uh thank you commissioner chu for um uh, starting the meeting and uh if we can have the moderator to begin agenda item number one which is roll call please Commissioners, please unmute your microphone so that you can verbally state your presence at today's meeting after your name is called. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Bell. Here. Commissioner Bush. Here. Commissioner Chu. Here. Commissioner Thinlev. Here, and that's the correct pronunciation. Thank you. 
Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> Chair Lee. Present. Um, I, I want to. Um, Madam Chair, with, with five members present and accounted for, you have a quorum. Thank you, moderator. I want to take this opportunity to welcome uh, Commissioner Dunlap to join us. You made this uh, commission complete for the first time in over half a year. Um, our newest commissioner brings to this commission a wealth of expertise and experience in uh, ethical and transparent government and governance. And I welcome you and I, I uh, want to see if you would like to take a moment to introduce yourself to uh, our um, commission uh, family as well as the San Francisco family. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here. I do just briefly want to introduce myself, not because it's terribly interesting, but it may help my fellow commissioners, members of the public, the staff, have a perspective in, as to where I'm coming from. Uh, about 15 years ago, I worked at the Fair Political Practices Commission, the state version of our ethics commission. While there, I was involved in writing regulations and advice letters to public officials throughout the state. I was then an advocate for Common Cause, which, as most of you probably know, is a kind of advocacy organization working on good government issues, campaign finance, disclosures. And then more recently, I was a prosecutor here in San Francisco at the district attorney's office working on public integrity matters. And for several years, I was the point of contact for the ethics commission. So I would get referrals from this commission. I would investigate to the extent that there were criminal things to investigate. I ran those investigations. So I have a decent amount of experience on the laws that we promulgate here at the commission that we enforce. In addition to that, I was also a city employee for five years. So I've taken a lot of the trainings that the commission provides for. So I think given that background, I hope to have some helpful expertise and background and experiences to share with the commissioner, to share with the public and the staff. And I look forward to working with everyone on these very important issues at these very important times. Madam Chair, thank you for the introduction. Fellow commissioners, it's nice to meet you. I look forward to working together and to the staff as well. Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome again. Would my fellow commissioners want to say a few words as well? Commissioner Chu. Yes, thank you, Chair Lee. Welcome, Commissioner Finlove. Um, I am looking forward to working with you. I think that your experience, uh, especially as an employee, someone who's been the recipient of um, the Ethics Commission training or participant, uh, will bring um, really welcome and needed insight into the work that we do going forward. And I think your experience uh, at the F. The CCP and the um, FPPC and uh, as, as a prosecutor will be really invaluable uh, as we consider today's ordinance measure and others going forward. So welcome. Thank you, Commissioner Chu. Commissioner Bush. Thank you. I wanted to uh, express my uh, appreciation for the your willingness to serve on this commission because uh, I think there's no doubt that you add value uh, from the experience that you've had and from the values that you represent. So welcome, I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Okay, uh, with that, let's proceed to agenda item number two, which is com public comments on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda today. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Ethics Commission is now receiving public comment on agenda item two remotely in this meeting. Each member of the public will have up to three minutes to provide public comment. If you join the meeting early to listen to the proceedings, now is the time to get in line to speak. If you have, if you have not already, press please press star three. It's important that you press star three only once to enter the queue, as pressing it again will move you out of the public comment line and back into listening mode. Once you are in the queue and standing by, the system will prompt you when it's your turn to speak, so it's important that you call from a quiet location. Please address your comments to the commission as a whole and not to individual members. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. If 
If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently on agenda item two, public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. You'll hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. Please stand by. Madam Chair, we have a caller in the queue. Please stand by. Okay. Welcome caller. Your three minutes begins now. Welcome caller. Your three minutes begins now. Uh, caller, if you if you can hear me, if you can hear me, uh, you have your hand raised. Yeah, you are unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, your three minutes begins now. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Marcos Major. I appreciate um, the opportunity to connect with you all, um, even amid all of our communication challenges. <laughs> I appreciate that. I am a uh, former city employee of several uh, agencies and currently a nonprofit director that partners with four or five agencies and several grant programs. And I applaud the Ethics Commission for taking on um, some of these challenges that our city has been facing for years, unfortunately. And there's a lot of issues um, that need to be addressed. And, you know, one of our partners was Public Works and uh, the Water Department and it's been very challenging to continue those relationships uh, in many ways with those agencies. I will say that I'm concerned about this type of legislation um, being proposed and um, as a person who's working directly with grantors, um, grant making staff, my my concern comes that I, I wonder if we're really targeting the right intention here, you know, uh, Obviously, there's been problems that need to be addressed, but I don't know that um, fiscal penalties um, for, you know, small potatoes nonprofits is really the way to go. And I certainly don't think that penalizing our partners who support small community-based organizations is really a way to go either. So I implore you to think about the ethics, you know, deeper than what we all want, which is to avoid money laundering and corruption, um, and to look at the real problems that will arise out of over uh, analyzing and penalizing folks for, you know, acting as individuals or as uh, city staff that really should be supporting what small organizations do. So um, I'm also concerned, you know, about all of the reporting um, that will be pending, potentially required for uh, with this proposed legislation. You know, I already have so much reporting to do, um, which is valid. But I must say, I also had state grants this year that were easier to turn in than any of my city grants. And it wasn't because of the questions were different. It was because of the extensive challenges faced by our city with, uh, you know, these internal challenges that we've all had to deal with the fallout. My question is for you all, are you going to push it down to the small nonprofits and people working for social justice and environmental justice, or are we going to actually target the right folks and move up the ladder instead of penalizing folks down the ladder? And specifically, your three minutes has expired. Thank you all so much. Please stand by. I would encourage the I would encourage Mr. Major to call back when we are on agenda item number six. Great. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Major. 
we are checking any to see callers? if there's any more. We are checking to see if there's any callers in the queue. Please stand by. Madam Chair, there's no further callers on the queue. Okay, agenda item number three, consent calendar, approval of draft minutes for December 10th. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. So moved. Okay, moved by Commissioner Chu, seconded by Commissioner Bush. Public comment, please. Please stand by. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Ethics Commission is now receiving public comment on consent calendar item three remotely in this meeting. Each member of the public will have up to three minutes to provide public comment. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. You join the meeting early to listen to the proceedings. Now is the time to get in line to speak. If you haven't already, please press star three. It is important that you press star three only once to enter the queue as pressing it again will move you out of the public comment line and back into listening mode. Once you are in the queue and standing by, the system will prompt you when it's your turn to speak. So it's important that you call from a quiet location. Madam Chair, we are still checking to see if there are callers in the queue. Please stand by. You have just joined this meeting. We are currently taking public comment on consent calendar item three, draft minutes of the commission's December 10th, 2021 regular meeting. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. Madam Chair, we have no callers in the queue. Okay, public comment is closed. Um, the motion to approve the minutes was moved and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. A motion has been made and seconded. I will now call the roll. Commissioner Bush. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Chair Lee. Aye. Commissioner Finlev. I was not a commissioner at the prior meeting, so I don't think I should approve the minutes. Yeah. So I'm going to abstain from this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Bell. Aye. <clears throat> With four votes in the affirmative and zero votes opposed, mm -hmm. the motion is approved unanimously. Okay, thank you. Consent calendar item number four, the resolution on the continuation of remote commission meetings. Um, my fellow commissioners, this is the same resolution that we uh, uh, that's come before us uh, since the uh, COVID uh uh, situation. So do I have a motion to approve this? So moved. Okay. Okay. Moved by Commissioner Chu, seconded by Commissioner Bush. Um, moderator, let's go for public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Ethics Commission is now receiving public comment on consent calendar item four remotely in this meeting. Each member of the public will have up to three minutes to provide public comment. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you just join this, if you join the meeting earlier to listen to the proceedings, now is the time to get in line to speak. If you have not already done so, please press star three. It is important that you press star three only once to enter the queue as president again will move you out of the public comment line and back into listening mode. Once you are in the queue and standing by, the system will prompt you when it's your turn to speak. So it's important that you call from a quiet location. Please stand by. You just joined this meeting. We're currently taking public comment on consent calendar item four, resolution on continuation of remote commission meetings. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. Stand by. Madam Chair, we have a caller in the queue. Welcome caller, your three minutes begins now. Commissioners, I want you to pay careful attention to what I'm saying. This is the Ethics Commission. And in order for the public to participate in the deliberations, 
everything has to be done in order. First of all, you all had some mishap with the SFPUC and you trying to arrange for this meeting. We understand that. But for the longest time, we couldn't get in, even though I was on, on the line. So I had to uh, contact somebody at City Hall so that, you know, something could be added so that the public could know about the number so that we could participate. Now, truly speaking, this is the Ethics Commission. You all have to be doubly, create a checklist, test the system so that we can participate in these deliberations. It's useless to say you are, you are passing a resolution on the continuation remote commission meetings, that's all fine. But are we participating with the public? We haven't, I, for example, haven't given my comment on the first three items. So do we have to have a continuation of the first three items? We have an expert now from the Fair uh, Political Practices Commission join you all. He, he may have to give you all an orientation on the Brown Act and, and other, really, uh, other laws that pertain to public comment. Public comment in San Francisco is sacrosanct. So please treat us with respect. I understand there'll be problems. I understand about an emergency, but I'm asking y'all to be vigilant and show your leadership. Good leaders know the way, show the way, and go the way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Please stand by. Yeah, I'm sure we have another caller in the queue. Please stand by. Welcome, caller. Your three minutes begins now. Good morning. This is Bob Plantold. I'm a former ethics commissioner from long ago. Um, I wanted to state that the sound is intermittently cut out, such as when Commissioner Chu was commenting, um, as well as when other people. So we can't really know what exactly you're saying, what's going on. That's an ongoing problem. It took me a while to find the phone number because it was not initially at the bottom. Well, the point is that going back to the approval of minutes, the Sunshine Ordinance specifically forbids, prevents in a, a recusal. It pre, I'm sorry, it, it forbids a, it forbids um, an abstention. That's possible for the um, state agencies, but not for the city. Parliamentary procedure does allow for somebody to say, because other people felt this was okay, I'll go along and agree, but you cannot abstain for any San Francisco agency subject to the Sunshine Ordinance. Please keep this in mind because you're going to wind up with problems down the line if you let this use of a state option continue into a city option that's forbidden. And again, try to deal with getting the sound made available all throughout this meeting. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I see Commissioner Bush's hand up. Yeah, and excuse me, Ronald, I don't think any of us can hear you right now, or at least I, I can't. Yeah. Sorry, mm -hmm. I forgot to unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I wanted to ask a question about abstending, which has just been raised by uh, former Commissioner Plantholt. What if instead of abstaining, it was a recusal? Wouldn't, couldn't you argue for a recusal on the basis that you were not a participant? Can we have uh, Deputy City Attorney um, Shen respond? Yeah, if, if, if I may, thank you for raising that question, Commissioner Bush, and thank you, former Commissioner Planthold. Um, 
commissioner Plantel is correct. Um, the charter does not allow commissioners to generally abstain from items before them. Um, there are limited occasions in which a commissioner can recuse. Well, obviously, if a commissioner has a conflict of interest and can't vote in the matter due to you know, requirements under state and local law, obviously the commissioner shouldn't participate. The commissioner can also ask the leave of his or her colleagues on the commission to allow them to recuse from a specific item. But, you know, Commissioner Planthold does raise a valid point. I apologize. I, I must have missed it before. Um, but if Commissioner Finlev did abstain on the approval of meeting minutes, to be technical about it, even though he was not in attendance at that prior meeting, he should vote on the matter and cannot abstain. So my apologies about, the, about, the, about that issue. So under this charter requirement, it would be best if the commission went back to that item, rescinded the vote, and re-voted on it. And Commissioner Fenlev, I, I realize it's a very awkward situation, but if he could vote yes or no on that matter, that would be appreciated. So can we um, finish voting on the uh, agenda item number four and then go back to agenda item number three just to right. be on the same side? Yeah, that would certainly make sense. Let's finish up this item, then quickly go back, take okay. care of that housekeeping matter, and, and hopefully keep going. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Um, Commissioner Bell, your hands up. Is it in response to this agenda item or? Yes. No, it's this item because when I first joined, I did the same thing. I tried to abstain. I I was feeling uh, Commissioner Finlev's pain there, and I was told I could not abstain at that point. I don't remember what we did, though. So I just want to say that I did the same thing when I first came on and was instructed that that was not an option. Um, so I don't remember what I voted, but um, the minutes will reflect that uh, whatever happened at that time. And um, I think we should proceed as uh, su suggested um, by Mr. Shen. Okay, um, Commissioner Bush, your hand is still up. Unmute, please. I'm sorry, I lower my hand. Okay, so why don't we finish up on um, agenda item number four, see if we have any more public comments. Please stand by. Madam Chair, there are no callers in the queue. Okay, so let's proceed to um, a vote on agenda item number four. We already have the motion and second. So roll call, please. Okay. A motion has been made and seconded. I will now call the roll. Commissioner Bush. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Chair Lee. Aye. Commissioner Finlev. Aye. Commissioner Bell. Aye. With five votes in the affirmative and zero votes opposed, the motion is approved unanimously. Um, per our legal counsel's advice, uh, we are going to uh, go back to agenda item number three. Uh, first, um, um, Deputy City Attorney, do we need a motion to rescind the vote? Um, yes, to be technical about it, yes. We would need, first need a motion to rescind okay. the prior vote and then a motion to approve the minutes again. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So do we have a motion to rescind our earlier vote? to approve the draft minutes. Okay, um, motion made by Commissioner Bush, seconded by me. Uh, do we have to go back to public comment? No, we've already taken public comment on this item, so we don't need to take it. Okay, again. so, okay, thank you. So roll call, please. A motion has been made and seconded. I will now call the roll. Commissioner Bush. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Chair Lee. Aye. Commissioner Finlev. Aye, based on the representations of my fellow commissioners. Commissioner Bell. Aye. With five votes in the affirmative and zero votes opposed, the motion is approved unanimously. Okay, thank you. Uh, now uh, I would like to entertain a new motion to approve the draft minutes of the December 10th meeting. Motion. Motion by Commissioner Chu. I'll second. Um, again, I uh, call for DCA Shen's advice. Do we need to go back to public comment? Uh, 
No. Okay. Thank you. So roll call, please. A motion has been made and seconded. I will now call the roll. Commissioner Bush. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Chair Lee. Aye. Commissioner Van Lev. Aye. Commissioner Bell. Aye. With five votes in the affirmative and zero votes opposed, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. And thank you, um, DCHN. Um, now we go to regular calendar uh, agenda item number five, which is the discussion and approval, uh, possible action to adopt Ethics Commission's regular meeting schedule for calendar year 2022. Thank you, Chair Lee. Uh, item five uh, was continued uh, from the December meeting. Uh, we did make one correction on the calendar. There was a date stated in error for the proposed October date. Uh, but this, uh, pursuant to the commission's bylaws, you'll recall that the commission establishes, uh, has established a regular meeting schedule uh, that indicates the, the day, date, and time and location of its regular meetings. Um, and so that's in the bylaws and pursuant to that to help with the public's engagement and uh, planning purposes over the course of the year, the commission's practice has been to establish a regular meeting schedule for the coming calendar year, uh, every January or February of the year or December. So uh, this document enables the commission to consider whether uh, it wants to keep meeting on the proposed uh, on the current schedule of the second um, the second uh, Friday uh, of each month, uh, starting at 9:30 a.m. As the proposed schedule notes, as long as the commission it continues to be meeting remotely, the location is identified as an online remote meeting. Uh, when uh, should uh, that change based on further guidance from the city administrative office and others about the resumption of on-site meetings, uh, the commission may wish to amend its calendar at that time to confirm that as well. Uh, but we have a proposed schedule based on the current bylaws for your consideration and discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Director Tellum. Any comments from the commissioners? Commissioner Bush? Unmute, please. All right. Uh, I would like to uh, let my fellow commissioners know that I will be seeking a change in the bylaws uh, and the approval of my colleagues to set, start our meetings at 10 o'clock rather than 9.30. I think that that's uh, works better uh, in general. And uh, I can elaborate uh, the reasons for that at the time that I uh, make the motion to add it to the agenda in the future meeting for a bylaw change. Uh, as a result of my belief that the 930 meeting doesn't provide sufficient time for the public to uh, participate, I intend to vote no on this schedule. I also <clears throat> know that we are keeping to the practice of providing the agenda uh, I think three days in advance of the meeting. Uh, and I don't think that that is sufficient. It's that's legally all that we're required to do. But I believe that a, a agenda that's a week out would be better as I think more likely to be prepared a week out, though it can be subject to uh, changes. Uh, because we're taking up issues that require some deliberation on the part of the public, and we want to encourage greater participation. And uh, a three-day advance, especially with a, a weekend in there, uh, makes it hard to get the kind of participation that I think we want to get. So I'm making that statement as we prepare to vote on this. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Bush. Um, um, Chair Lee, if I might, as a point of information. Uh -huh. uh, I just wanted to clarify the commission meetings uh, agendas 
uh, are regularly posted a, a week before the commission meeting. There is, as you know, Commissioner Bush, the requirement that we provide them no less than three days in advance to comply with meetings laws. But as you'll see for next week's meeting, for example, those documents will be posted online uh, uh, at close of business today. So uh, there may have been a, a recent exception where that didn't happen, but I, our practice has been as a regular course of things to post them and get them out to folks so we can advance for precisely the reasons you mentioned. So thank you for that, that opportunity and feedback. Okay. Okay. Um, shall we entertain a motion to approve the proposed calendar for the new year? So moved. Second. Okay. Thank you. Moved by Commissioner Bell, seconded by Commissioner Chu. Uh, Mr. Moderator, let's go for public comment, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently on the public discussion on the motion of agenda item five, discussion and possible action to adopt ethics commission's regular meeting schedule for calendar year 2022. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. You'll hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please stand by. Madam Chair, we have a caller in the queue. Thank you, caller. Your three minutes begins now. Good morning. This is Bob Planthold again. Um, I wanted to respond to Commissioner Bush's suggestion of a bylaws change. And this is just information because, again, your screen stops in uh, uh, providing sound and or freezes. So I don't know whether I'll be able to join in the future. It is worth considering altering the starting time. And the reason is simply that some people with disabilities who need a personal care attendant cannot get ready in time to call in at 930. Beyond that, if you're a single parent trying to get your kids to school, you may not be able to get back home in time for a 930 start. I mean, there are different constituencies that normally may not um, participate in ethics meetings, but considering some of the agenda items and some of the stories about San Francisco corruption and ineptness, there could be more people wanting to call in in the future. So keep in mind, constituencies unlike yourselves, people with disabilities who need a personal care attendant to get ready in the morning, single parents having to get their kids to school, those are groups that also ought to be able to easily call in at a timely start, which 930 is not. Thank you. your color. Please stand by. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have another caller in the queue. Please stand by. Thank you, caller. Your three minutes begins now. So, Commissioners, uh, my name is uh, Francisco da Costa, and um, I've uh, been paying uh, very careful attention to what is happening to our city. Having uh, participated for many years with the Sunshine Task Force, the Ethics Commission, with the Controller's Office. And I'm saying this because people are fed up more with this pandemic with all the corruption that's going on in the city and county of San Francisco. And as far as the Ethics Commission is concerned, you all have been kicking the can down the street. For example, when a whistleblower goes to the controller's office, having failed with the Sunshine Task Force and the Ethics Commission, the controller's office 
have chosen to give the empirical data that the whistleblower gives to the controller's office to the city attorney. Today, the city should be ashamed of itself that the former city attorney now is the general manager of the SFPUC, the same entity that he should have done some justice with, but has failed. And then we got another person from Sacramento. Now he's a city attorney. And we have the mayor in the cockpit, you know, singing the blues. And you, Ethics Commission, have no clue what is happening to our city. The timing, <coughs> as uh, one of the persons who was talking said, should be around 10 o'clock. And one of you commissioners said it too. We are very lucky that we have one commissioner who is astute, and uh, I know him and he knows me, so I'm not going to say his name. But he's watching, and I'm watching, and I have a blog, and I send some of my articles to the Ethics Commission. I don't know if the Ethics Commission distributes it to all the commissioners. But we are in dire straits, commissioners. We used to be a city where there was some semblance, no more. We are in dire straits. This is the most corrupt city in the nation, on par with, Your with three minutes uh, has expired. Chicago and Los Angeles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carla. Please stand by. Mm -hmm. Checking to see if there's any further callers in the queue. Madam Chair, there are no callers in the queue. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, before we vote on this item, uh, I just want to uh, clarify until the bylaw um, uh, situation is taken up. My understanding is we can still change the meeting time and meeting date as long as we give a seven day notice. So technically, if we want to move next Friday's uh, scheduled commission meeting to a later time, we can certainly do that. And uh, I would uh, suggest that we do that for the next meeting uh, until we can fully address future meeting uh, starting times through the bylaw discussion. Okay, so uh, shall we take a vote on this item, please? Shirley, if uh, I might yeah. ask to clarify, are you, is, is this a motion to adopt the reg the calendar for a regular meeting schedule as shown with the amendment that the January 21st meeting will start at 10 o'clock. Do we need an amendment? Can we just... Well, I, I just wanted to be clear if, if the 10 o'clock time frame is the commission's action that, 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 that we reflect that here so that the record's clear. Perhaps Andrew, uh, City Attorney Shen can weigh in. Yeah, yeah, just very briefly, I think it would be better for the public and just for the record to make, to make the amendment that Leanne just suggested. Just, just just be clear that at least this one meeting on the 21st will start at 10 instead of 930. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think Commissioner Chu was the um, commissioner who made the motion, so yeah, is so. this agreeable to you? Oh, oh my yeah. apologies. I will amend the motion to approve the, the calendar as proposed, uh, except for the start time for the January 21st meeting uh, would be 10 a.m., not 9.30. Okay, thank you. Seconded by Commissioner Bush. Roll call, please. A motion has been made and seconded. I will now call the roll. Commissioner Bush. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Chair Lee. 
Aye. Chair Finlev. Commissioner Finlev, aye. Commissioner Bell. Aye. With five votes in the affirmative and zero votes opposed, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. Now to agenda item number six, which is discussion on possible action on proposed uh, proposal regarding a possible June 2022nd ballot measure and regulation amendments to enact recommendations contained in report on gift laws, part A, gifts to individuals dated August 2nd, 2021, Report on gift laws, part B, gifts to city departments dated September 9, 2021, and report on strengthening basic ethics provisions dated December 6, 2021. Uh, before I ask um, for staff report, uh, I recall at the last commission meeting, Deputy City Attorney Shen had laid out the legal timeline uh, for a ballot um, measure um, to be qualified for the June election. Uh, so before I, uh, before we have the staff uh, presentation and, and discussion, I'd like to ask uh, BCA Shen again to uh, remind us of this ballot measure timeframe, um, if you could please. Of course, Chair. Of, of course, Chair Lee. Yeah, just briefly for the benefit of the public and the commission, uh, just another reminder that if the commission wishes to place this measure on the June primary ballot of this year, the Ethics Commission is required to submit to the Department of Elections at least 95 days in advance. That 95-day deadline, to meet that 95-day deadline, we'd have to submit it by Friday, March 4th. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bush, your hand is up. Was it from the last agenda item? It, it was for the last agenda item, but I would like to weigh in on this one as well. Uh, and would just- Would you like to wait? Okay. Would you like to wait until the staff um, presentation or you want to make your comments now? I can wait. Okay. You'll never hear me say that again. Okay. Director Pallum. Thank you, Chair Lee, and um, good morning, commissioners, and welcome for, on behalf of the staff to our new commissioner, Finlev. Uh, we, we're delighted to have you on board and look forward to working with you as well. Um, I think I wanted to just provide a bit of a, a context setting since our last commission meeting. If I could first, before turning it over to Michael and Pat uh, on the on the, some of the additional substance of of where we are on the issue in more detail, um, but I thought it would be helpful to take a few moments this morning to, um, uh, especially for the benefit perhaps of our new commissioner, but to recap on the, the policy goals that we're seeking to achieve through this policy and legislative work, um, and as I said, context for for where we are today and what you'll be hearing about from Michael and Pat. Um, we attached uh, to the memo and the documents that were previously provided an update um, to ensure that the commission is aware of substantive feedback that we've received since the last uh, commission meeting about um, issues that have been noted um, by folks who've been sharing feedback with us and uh, how we believe those issues can be addressed constructively. So we wanted to provide that for you this morning and make sure you have that information as well. Um, after our last commission meeting um, on December the 10th, I had the opportunity to meet with department heads at the request of the mayor at her monthly department head meeting that was held on December 15th. Um, they asked for me to provide an overview of the project and the proposals that we um, are, uh, are engaged in uh, as this process has gone along. And I, in a rather, um, I think, lengthy and, and a robust um, impassioned feedback session, a session that followed um, my, my comments, um, there were two main substantive comments that were relayed by department heads that spoke. Uh, and um, several spoke uh, at conveying the view that the, um, that the laws that we currently have are, net, uh, are sufficient. Um, already laws were on the books that enabled those who were found to be engaging in corrupt actions to have been caught and to be penalized. And those comments uh, suggested that early the current laws are sufficient for that purpose as evidenced by those uh, indictments and uh, 
uh, other um, uh, penalties and, and consequences that have happened for those individuals. Um, several other department heads stated a concern that is currently written. The, the proposals that we've offered um, would have unintended consequences uh, that would negatively impact organizations um, that are benefiting from departmental and staff support uh, for the work that they're engaged in. So I wanted to just briefly take a moment to speak first to the question of why we've engaged in uh, new approaches and examining some new thinking and new um, takes on where the law needs to be strengthened um, and and then respond to a couple of other comments um, uh, regarding the impact to organizations that, that I think have been conveyed. Um, you know, as, as we know from our language of the ordinances that we have, the laws that we have were created to assure that governmental processes here in San Francisco, and this is from section 3.200, promote fairness and equity for all residents and to maintain public trust in governmental institutions. So as you know, the purpose of this project has been to take a really close look at examining whether current law adequately identifies and um, prohibits conduct that could give rise to conflicts of interest um, or otherwise undermine decision-making that's fair and objective in the city um, or that fails where the laws might fail to fully support fairness and equity for all residents. So where current laws and programs have been um, demonstrated in our view and in our research to be insufficient, we've taken steps through this project, as you know, to recommend and implement improvements that we think will help strengthen the systems that we operate within going forward. Um, so I think from feedback that, that I've heard at the department meeting, the department head meeting in December and in individual departmental uh, meetings that we engaged in following the December 15th meeting, there is clearly widespread acknowledgement that ethics laws are important and that they're necessary uh, and that they need to be strong and workable and enforceable in practice. Uh, at the same time, the argument has been put forward that once individuals who violate the law um, have been caught, um, that has sent some signal, I guess, to some folks that the current system is working fine. Um, and I, I, I think I, it, internally, I, I, we've talked about what that argument um, reflects. And it, in, in some ways, it's a bit like saying that when a fire happens or a series of fires happen, once they're over, we don't talk about fire safety. Um, we know that there have been multiple city officials that have been found to have violated both public laws and the public trust. And uh, many department heads, a number of department heads have had to resign or been arrested because of the recent public corruption investigations. So I think we, we, we see that very clearly. We, we ask ourselves and continue to ask ourselves, what can we do to make sure that the systems that we're all operating in elevate our work, reflect the trust that we are working hard to earn and that, uh, that do lead to fair and equitable outcomes. Um, so I think um, it's it's important to assess where systemic change might be needed. Um, it's a, important to question whether the status quo is really the best that we can do. And is that really the standard that we hold ourselves to? And I think the answer from departments is no. We know that there are better standards. So we've been engaged in discussion about what those standards need to be. Um, so <clears throat> of course we will be continuing and we have been looking systemically at these issues because uh, there may be bad actors who take bad actions individually, but we know that there's also um, questions about how we can strengthen the environments that we all operate within so that those environments don't tolerate those kinds of corrupt um, practices that have been elevated and escalated in the, um, into, a, into a, um, investigations and penalties for individuals who engaged. Um, in those practices. Um, so th the second issue I think is this, the argument has been made that, that there are equity concerns, um, that ensuring equitable policy and equity and delivering our city, uh, city services is essential. And we couldn't agree more. There's no question about that. Um, pay to play uh, in, in my view is an inequity. Uh, when people lose out on opportunities to participate because they don't make certain payments or when they feel compelled to make payments, to do their work or to succeed in their work, those are kinds of concerns that of course fall into the question of how could we do better? Um, and we know that inequity perpetuates itself by weakening public trust. Uh, nearly a year ago, this commission issued a budget statement citing its own concern that equity is not advanced when the public loses faith in the legitimacy of government and opts out of participating. So undue influence and unfair advantage are inequities that, that uh, I think have been concerning uh, on our radar um, with government favors those with resources and connections and money over those who don't have or don't choose to use those things. 
um, we have to ask again, how do we do better? We think ethics laws promote equity. We think corrupt practice, practices destroys it. So it's also within our mandate as a commission from uh, San Francisco voters to give the commission the authority to place things directly before the voters. I think that's a recognition that San Francisco voters uniquely have uh, recognized how hard culture change is, how deep political culture runs, and that sometimes direct voter action is exactly the appropriate tool that's necessary uh, to accomplish needed change. So I think these are these are conversations that this commission has been engaged in. I think this is, uh, I just wanted to set a bit of context for um, a process that we've been engaged in since the December meeting. Uh, it has been about uh, listening and I think responding to try to strengthen and clarify the laws in the best way possible um, so that the laws that we have do reflect a healthy system and, and, a, and an environment that we do our work in as, as government uh, servants um, and public servants in government. Um, so that we do have the ability to serve all with integrity and with with uh, equity in a way that builds public trust. So that's a bit of an update from the December meeting. It's been a busy several weeks, um, and Pat and Mike are uh, Michael are here to to share further information about the substance of the recommendations. And I know we also have uh, others uh, on the line who I think will have some additional uh, feedback for you. But I wanted to present that context at the outset of the discussion today. So thank you for that opportunity. M Madam Chair, can I ask a question? Oh. Hey. Uh, Director Pelham, thank you very much for that. You mentioned the uh, concerns that there were unintended consequences. Is that part of what Pat and um, and Michael will be talking about? I just want to make sure we cover that because I'm very interested in, yes. in that topic. Uh, so, yes, thank you, uh, Commissioner Finlow, for the question. Um, my description of unintended consequences is what I was hearing from the department heads at the December 15th meeting. Uh, I think if the question, if the, the concern that somehow the laws that we are proposing have been designed to stop good work on behalf of city departments that benefit the community, and certainly that is not the intent. And, and if that is a, an, an unintended consequence that in some way uh, emerged in this discussion and feedback, clearly that's something that we want to correct and corral, which is what we we think we have uh, started doing with the, the language that uh, and the letter that you've seen that we attached to our our uh, report this morning. So that's 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 what I mean by unintended consequences. But yes, absolutely, we're, we're we're talking about that in the in the conversation that Michael and Pat can can have shortly. Thank you. So let's proceed to Mr. Ford's presentation. Great, thank you, Chair Lee. And uh, actually, we'll have Mr. Canning, Michael Canning, um, give the update this month. Okay. Great. Thank you, Pat, and thank you for the uh, introductory context, uh, Director Pelham. Um, thanks to the commissioners, and also welcome to Commissioner uh, Finlov. Great, great to have you. Um, so yeah, I'd like to give a brief update on the status of the proposed ballot measure and regulation amendments to enact the regulations that were contained in the reports associated with phases two and three of the current policy project. Um, the most recent update is from yesterday. Staff uh, met with the MEA, the Municipal Executive Association, as part of the ongoing meet and confer process and were unable to conclude the meet and confer process um, which uh, means the commission is unable to take action uh, today on this item. And I'd like to kind of start by just briefly reviewing the timeline of the meet and confer process and uh, some of what's been happening in the last month since the last meeting. Um, we also have invited representatives from uh, DHR to attend today's meeting uh, to speak generally about the meet and confer process, uh, should you wish to hear from them, um, which could be valuable since we have been made aware that there are certain uh, confidentiality um, issues and limits around what can be discussed related to the meet and confer process in open session. Um, but first, at a high level, um, the meet and confer process uh, began on November 10th of last year when DHR distributed the text of the measure and regulation changes to the MEA and other unions. Then on November 17th, uh, staff presented uh, the package of reforms to the MEA. Then on December 9th, uh, DHR distributed a closeout notice for uh, the meet and confer process, stating that because no questions or concerns had been raised since the previous month's presentation, uh, at the wow. November 17th meeting, the process uh, could be concluded, uh, in which case that would have allowed the commission to act on this matter at the December 10th meeting last month. Uh, however, later that day on December 9th, the MEA notified DHR of their desire to continue the meet and confer process, 
which is why action was not able to be taken uh, last month. Uh, at that meeting, there were also several departments that spoke um, asking for uh, continuation of the item. And since then, staff has been meeting with those departments, including the Asian Art Museum, the Fine Arts Museum, the Arts Commission, Recreation and Park, and the airport. Uh, I've had one-on-one -on -one meetings with those uh, departments. Uh, then on the 17th of December, uh, there was a second meet and confer meeting with the MEA. Uh, and that did not uh, lead to a closeout of the meet and confer process, um, but issues were identified and a response was sent uh, to the MEA on December 27th, uh, which is the letter that's attached as exhibit uh, attachment three to this agenda item. Uh, that uh, proposed uh, amendments to address the concerns raised by uh, MEA. Um, there was no response received to that letter. Um, and then on the 13th of January, which is yesterday, uh, we had an additional, a third meet and confer meeting. Um, and as I said, we're not able to close out meet and confer, um, which uh, means we're on a uh, commission is unable to take action at this point. Um, and I believe that uh, DHR Director uh, Carol Eisen is in attendance and is available to speak generally uh, to the commission about how the meet and confer process works and maybe explain why the commission is unable to uh, to act at this time. Um, so uh, if the commission would like, we could uh, you know discuss that meet and confer process in more detail and perhaps hear from uh, Ms. Eisen um, or just move on to more general uh, questions about the measure uh, if preferred. If we could ask Ms. Eisen to speak, to give us more information. Uh, good morning, uh, President Lee, members of the commission. I'm happy to answer any questions generally that you might have about um, our obligation under state law to meet and confer in good faith over any matters that uh, affect wages, hours, terms, and conditions of employment, which um, this proposed measure certainly would. Um, I'm not sure what orientation this commission has had about it. Uh, I can just generally say that um, in the city charter, the um, DHR director, which is myself, um, and through um, my employee relations director is responsible uh, to carry out this obligation under law on behalf of all the city, its agents, commissions, boards, and so forth. So we provide this service um, uh, from to the executive branch as uh, well as to the legislative branch and all the constituent commissions. Um, so we've been pretty busy lately, as you might imagine. Um, this is obviously very important work um, for the whole city. And um, I'm not really here to comment, um, you know, in terms of policy one way or another, just simply on the commission's obligation to engage in that meeting confer process. Uh, it can be brief or it can be very lengthy. Um, and at this point, uh, it's would not be easy for me to predict uh, how it will go. And we do appreciate the um, policy work and support that we have gotten from your staff um, to engage uh, our labor unions in discussion on this measure. And I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Uh, I should just also let you know that if you do want a more detailed briefing about the positions of the parties, uh, I would have to do that in closed session. Because. I'm sorry, Commissioner Lee, is there a question? Yeah, uh, why is it that we have to go to closed session? Did we want a briefing from you? Uh, is it a I, legal requirement? Yeah, I'm not, I can't provide you with an, uh, a position on the party of the union or unions that are engaged in meet and confer um, without full permission of those parties. We have not uh, sought that. Um, I was not aware that the commission might be interested in it if it is, uh, but it would be quite atypical. We would typically meet in closed session. It is a very specific um, provision within the Brown Act to be able to br brief any policy body on progress in 
labor negotiations. And I'd be prepared to do that either myself directly or uh, in conjunction with our employee relations director, Artis Graham. Okay. Thank you, Teresa Eisen. Of course. Uh, I see Commissioner Bush's hand is up. You're muted, Mr. Bush. I'm not muted. Thank you. Uh, if I understand correctly, the meet and confer obligation is that we reach out and seek to meet and confer on proposals, but it does not obligate us to come to an agreement with the other parties. Uh, in fact, after a meet and confer, we can declare that we are satisfied that we have met that and move forward. Is that your understanding, Ms. Eisen? Yes, it is. So we don't have an, any obligation to reach a conclusion with the departments. We just had to have met with them and we've done that, correct? You have not completed the process. So that last portion of your statement would be incorrect. I'm happy to- What, what, what is the portion that we have not completed? Um, very broadly, uh, meet and confer the, your obligation under state law, the myers Milius brown Act, uh, requires that you meet and confer in good faith over any matter that affects wages, hours, terms, and conditions of employment. Um, any affected union has the right to understand what you're doing, um, make counter proposals, and this commission would have an obligation to fully and fairly evaluate those counter proposals. And we would go through a back and forth process. In the end, if we cannot reach agreement um, and the parties are uh, divided over one or more matters, at that point an impasse is reached um, and the union or unions uh, can make a decision that it would like to access the uh, fact-finding provisions in state law um, and uh, engage this commission in a fact-finding process. A fact-finder would be employed, a, a fact-finding panel would be seated, and we would engage in that fact-finding process. I have been through this many, many times over a long time. It can happen very quickly or it can go on for um, uh, it can go on for months, uh, up to a year. It's it's uh, it's hard to predict at this point. But there have already been three meetings. Is that correct? There, as I understand it, there have been three meetings. Yes. So we've had three meetings, and not reached a resolution that's satisfactory to the unions. Correct. Um, I'm not sure of the nature of this inquiry. I can only provide you with general discussion. I will say from what I know, you are um, in process in the early stages of meet and confer in which ideas are exchanged and proposals are exchanged. Information is uh, being answered. This is an exercise that we are required under law to engage in, and we have to do it fully and fairly and take it to its natural conclusion. But as I understand what was said from the uh, staff is that a presentation was made, an invitation to engage and meet and confer was extended, and the departments did not respond until the close of the last day. Is that correct? I would have to review the record. It's I have no reason to doubt what they're saying, but I that uh, brief history in no way obviates this commission from engaging in the meet and confer process. I understand it doesn't uh, eliminate our obligation, but it does tell me that there is a lack of urgency on the department on the part of departments to respond in a meaningful way with this commission on a matter that affects their members. They waited the entire time that they had 
and then at the very the last minute parachuted in. What this comes down to is that by dragging this out, it means it cannot be on the June ballot. The earliest it could be on would be November. That's not exactly what the voters look for in urgency on a corruption scale. So I'm calling shame on that part of the process. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bush. Commissioner Finhoff. Thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you, Director Eisen. Um, I wanna say that I think hearing directly from the stakeholders to me as a commissioner is very important. So I would welcome the opportunity to be briefed uh, in closed session, basically as soon as that can be done. I think it's very valuable to hear concerns directly. Not that we're gonna agree with all the concerns, but I think it's important to hear them out uh, directly if possible. And then related to that, or not related, but I have a question. Is the meet and confer process only apply to the MEA? I ask because my assumption is that our proposal would govern or rather would apply to many city employees who are not part of that bargaining unit. Is that because no other units express interest in doing this process or the obligation only extends to that bargaining unit? It would extend to all bargaining units. And again, I'm happy to discuss that matter in closed session. Thank you. Um, with no other comments from the commissioners, let's open up for public comment, please, Mr. Moderator. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you've just joined this meeting, we are currently on the public discussion on the motion of agenda item six. Discussion and possible action on proposal regarding a possible June 2022 ballot measure and regulation amendments to enact recommendations contained in Report on Gift Laws Part A, Gifts to Individuals, dated August 2nd, 2021. Reports on Gift Laws Part B, Gifts to City Departments, dated September 29th, 2021. And Report on Strengthening Basic Ethics Provisions, dated December 6th, 2021. If you've not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please stand by. Madam Chair, we have callers in the queue. Welcome caller, your three minutes begins now. So commissioners, Uh, first and foremost, I would like to point out that we have to zero in on the Human Resources Department. We have a new director. We have a chief operating officer that is has uh, retired after many, many years. And we have a financial, uh, a chief financial officer who is jumping ship and going to another entity. So I'm asking you, Ethics Commission, uh, do you know of this situation? Do we have people in the cockpit that really know where we are going? Secondly, if you look at the cases that have come before the Sunshine Task Force regarding gift laws, if, uh, we, the people, have had uh, a vote in the Sunshine Task Force 9 to 0, one example being the Baby Opera House, $3.5 million missing, and other issues related to it, nothing. The Sunshine Task Force chose to send the matter to the Board of Supervisors where it's they it faded into oblivion, did not send it to the Ethics Commission because the Sunshine Task Force felt that the Ethics Commission could do nothing. Now, we the people have to listen to this merry-go-round. And we the people know 
there are various levels of corruption. The city departments are corrupt. The main department that controls the city is corrupt. We've had a change in the city administrator's office. The former assessor is now the city administrator. Some 33,000 employees under her care or jurisdiction. As I have been saying many times to the Ethics Commission, you all cannot do your job because simply put, you do not have the talent nor the resources. When you are in a bind, you will call upon the city attorney who will say he says something, but it means nothing. You call upon your staff, the director. She says something, but it means nothing because they speak in generalities. Your three minutes has expired. Please stand by. Welcome, caller. Your three minutes begins now. Good morning, commissioners. This is Debbie Lerman from the San Francisco Human Services Network. First of all, I appreciate this commission's actions to address the recent corruption scandals and prevent similar violations in the future. However, we urge you to take a careful and balanced approach that protects beneficial activities. First, I wanna say that HSN supports the Municipal Executive Association request for an exemption allowing city officials to accept free attendance to nonprofit fundraisers. Attendance at these events are necessary for city employees to evaluate the work of their, de of their department's contractors. This attendance benefits both nonprofits and the city in other ways. And particularly in health and human services, the city typically underfunds the true cost of programs and expects nonprofits to raise substantial additional funds to support their organizations. So just as with behested contributions, it's crucial that our, our nonprofits have the support and assistance of city officials in raising the necessary private funds that ensure the sustainability of the agency and its programs. By their very presence at fundraisers, city officials build relationships with nonprofit staff and donors. They, they provide credibility, sending the message to donors that this organization is a good city partner. They're available to answer donors' questions about the programs and how they fit into the big picture of city, of city strategies to address homelessness and behavioral health treatment. Second, I wanna say the measure includes overly broad restricted source language that was also problematic in the original behested contributions draft legislation. The language in this measure should mirror the board's legislation on behested contributions, specifically around the exemption of nonprofit board members, and more specific language for those who attempt to influence legislation. And finally, the requirement of a supermajority of ethics commission and board to amend ethics laws is troubling. These laws often have implications for first amendment rights and are subject to unintended consequences. And this proposal sets too high a bar through which a small minority can block reasonable changes to the law. I urge this commission to take more time to review the proposed measure and get it right before it goes to the ballot. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Thank you, Madam Chair, can I ask a, uh, make a comment? Um, shall we continue with the public comments first because they've been waiting uh, in two? It's relevant to that last know. public comment. Uh, okay. Thank you for your indulgence. I know Ms. Uh, Director Lerman is no longer on the line, but I believe the staff made some proposals to the MEA that addressed her concern about city officials' attendance at uh, uh, affiliated events. So I would love to the extent Director Lerman is still available at the next public comment, if she could weigh in whether she thinks those amendments, which to me seem very reasonable, but I'd love to hear her perspective if, they, if she thinks they don't accomplish her goals. 
Thank you for allowing me to make that comment, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Lee, may I ask um, Deputy City Attorney Shen to uh, clarify the supermajority requirements regarding ethics legislation? You mean in terms of what is proposed in the in the ballot measure or just more generally? More generally. And, uh, and, yes, well, and, and sure. in the ballot measure specifically. Yeah, so I would say just sort of generally, um, many of the laws that are within the Ethics Commission's jurisdiction, because they were first adopted by the voters and there are special amendment provisions built into those voter adopted measures, future amendments require supermajority approval by both the Ethics Commission and the Board of Supervisors. So large portions of the city's campaign finance laws are subject to these amendment provisions, as are large portions of the city's ethics and gift laws. Um, one aspect of this ballot measure is that it would incorporate the supermajority vote requirements essentially the, to the totality of all sort of ethics related laws within the Ethics Commission's jurisdiction. So there's be this broader approach where all future amendments would again be subject to supermajority vote approval of both the Ethics Commission and the Board of Supervisors. Does, does that answer your question, Commissioner Chu? It does, because in the absence of a supermajority provision, then the, for example, the Board of Supervisors by simple majority vote could change ethics laws. That's correct. Um, there are some chapters of the Campaign and Governmental Conduct Code that currently could be simply amended by the Board of Supervisors by majority vote. Uh, for example, there are portions of the city's lobbyist ordinance that could be amended in such fashion, as well as the city's whistleblower ordinance, just as an example. Uh, thank you. That's why I, that's why I think that it's really critical that this provision remain in the ordinance and be uh, approved by the voters, so that the the uh, legislation that the and and rules that the ethics commission crafts, um, you know, cannot be undone um, by by a simple majority vote um, uh, by the board of supervisors, um, which is part of the regulated community, who who may or may not be acting. Uh, against their own self-interest in doing so, or in their, they will be acting in their self-interest uh, in doing so. Thank you. I see um, several hands were raised from my colleagues, but out of uh, uh, respect for the uh, public callers who have been waiting uh, in queue. So let's finish up the public comment and then we'll go back to uh, commissioners' comments if that's fine with everybody. So, Mr. Moderator, do we have any more callers? Unmute, please. You're muted. Hello. Unmute. Hello. Welcome, caller. Your three minutes begins now. Hi, um, I'm Sean Rosen Moss. I'm the manager of development and community partnerships for the San Francisco Department of the Environment. Good morning, and thank you so much for your efforts to foster transparency in city government. Um, I do have a couple of questions and comments about this proposed legislation. The first one is how many and how much? How many city departments, city staff will this impact? Because connected to that, of course, is how much is it going to cost the city to comply with the legislation? How much in administrative time? And connected to that, there's opportunity cost, obviously. I work on climate change. How much time is going to be taken away from my work in that area to deal with some of the administrative tasks required of this legislation? Another question, how many of our partners is this going to impact? How many nonprofits, small businesses, local contractors will now have an additional layer of admin tasks to, as was mentioned earlier, the already burdensome reporting requirements we ask of them? So that needs to be looked at. And then, and then which of these partners is going to be the most burdened by having to deal with this legislation? I know in most city departments, we have to look at every proposed policy, program, campaign through an equity lens. And I do think that needs to happen here, that, that we have to look at who is going to be the most impacted, because I suspect the most impacted are going to be a lot of our smaller grassroots organizations who really don't have the legal and administrative staff to deal with the requisite requirements of the legislation which could possibly impact their ability to partner with the city. And then the last thing, I am a public servant, right? I serve the public and like almost all of us here today, whether we're from cities, whether we're from CBOs, we take that work really seriously. 
And in order to fully serve the public, we have to show up. We have to support. We have to be out there collaborating and coordinating. And I do think this legislation, as it's written, is going to have a chilling effect on our ability to continue doing that, to continue building the relationships and the partnerships that are crucial to addressing the city's pressing issues, whether it's climate change, providing access to the arts and green space, providing access to educational workforce development opportunities, dealing with homelessness. City staff can't do it by themselves. CBOs can't do it by themselves. Business can't do it by themselves. We have to do it together. And I think as written, one of the unintended consequences of this legislation is that it's going to make it so much harder for us to do that. And then the very last thing is that I do think this proposed legislation may also have a really chilling effect on people's ability to participate in government. If we can't show up, if we can't talk to people, then how are they going to how are they going to participate? How are we going to get the civic engagement that we know is necessary for us to move forward as a city? So that's all I wanted to say. And again, three minutes thank expired. you very much for your help. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Please stand by. We have other callers in the queue. Please stand by. I'm sorry. I apologize. Welcome, caller. Your three minutes begins now. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ralph Remington. I'm Director of Cultural Affairs uh, at the San Francisco Arts Commission. Uh, I just want to say briefly that uh, we believe that uh, we should always train on ethics to Executive Director uh, Pelham's comments earlier. We should always train on ethics. Uh, so I reject the fire safety training analysis uh, because but that would be uh, analogous to if there was arson in a building. And there are laws to take care of arson. And there are ethics laws to take care of our ethics complaints. So that, that would be equivalent to arson, not, not to just training on fire safety. And so when we're talking about ethics violations, that's what we're talking about. I want to say that I think that this is overly broad. Uh, it's overreach, uh, arbitrary and capricious. Uh, the the solution in search of a problem. Uh, I believe that those people have already been caught. Although I do think that there are ethics things that we need to tighten in the city and the ethics regulations that we do need to tighten. However, this is not the way to do it as written. So uh, I'll have comments later at other meetings, but today I think that that will suffice. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Please stand by. Welcome, caller. Your three minutes begins now. Good morning. This is Bob Plantle calling again. Um, contrary to what the previous person said, not all the guilty parties or alleged guilty parties have been apprehended or charged, such as the statements from the U.S. Department of Justice. This is still an ongoing process, and therefore we should not assume that things have been resolved adequately regarding ethics compliance. As far as meet and confer, here's a problem that one administrative agency is blocking the actions decision process for a um, ethics a charter commission. However, if you accede to that, you know, the person said that she cannot reveal the positions of the parties except in closed session. That does not prevent you folks and the public from getting a list of the topics being considered and therefore also whether any of those topics have been adequately addressed. All of this in silence does not inspire confidence, not only in you folks, but I'm going to say in HR and in those who use uh, meet and confer as a hammer to thwart better government. I want to address also the question request from an earlier commissioner about um, interceding in public comment. You're not supposed to do that. 
and you're not supposed to respond to public comment. And beyond that, the potential request for Ms. Lerman or anybody else to come back, again, you're making that person an equal party to you folks as opposed to a member of the public because the request was get a chance to speak again. No, public comment is one time only, one time only on each agenda item. You've got to be fair to all of the public who aren't, if you will, in power. Separate from my work in ethics, I've been on four grand juries. I've been on the Sunshine Task Force. I've got, if you will, a wealth of local good government experience. That's why I keep bringing up you got to do better about your own performance, not allowing somebody to have a second bite at the apple. But at least if you're going to defer action, get a list of the topics that the public can know what is being discussed. That doesn't reveal the positions. And maybe even list what topics have been addressed. That doesn't mean what is the text. It just says this has been addressed, this has been resolved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Please stand by. Thank you, caller. Your three minutes begins now. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Lisa Branston, and I'm the Director of Partnerships at the Recreation and Park Department. I wanted to echo the other speakers and say that I honestly welcome anything that makes government better, fair, and more transparent. Um, but I do have some concerns about this legislation. Um, I personally came to government work late in my career from the private sector, and where I once saw the people who ran city services as faceless bureaucrats, I now understand the professionalism, thoughtfulness, and hard work of my colleagues, from office staff like myself to rec leaders, gardeners, painters, carpenters, and other boots on the ground. I firmly and honestly believe that it's in the public's interest to meet and interact with these people and for city staff to show support for our community partners. I have concerns that this law would have a chilling effect on some of that interaction. The Rec and Park Department gives out over 100,000 permits a year and has thousands of contractors, most of which most staff are not even aware of. The dramatic expansion of the restricted source definition creates an enormous administrative burden for staff and more importantly, will only wall off city staff from community um, by creating nervousness about community interaction when really there is no intent to influence. So a couple of my remaining questions are, um, what is the definition of a ministerial awarded permit? I think having this be a gray area um, would be very concerning for staff trying to do the right thing. What is the, similarly, what's the definition of necessary to do one's job? Again, staff need a very clear definition of this so that they're not nervous about participating in community events. Another question is why allow exceptions for fundraisers and ticketed art events, but not other events such as sports games or conferences? What about community celebrations where there might be food on offer for everyone? Do we not participate in those? Do we go to those and not participate fully with the community? And, and then why are there no exceptions for small gifts? For example, if the husband of a gardener who's a teacher receives a gift from a parent of one of his students and the parent happens to be a restricted source, is that a violation of the rule, no matter how small the gift? I wanna thank the commission for working to address some of the confusion and concerns, but I do believe many questions remain that create a troubling gotcha potential if there's a difference of opinion regarding definitions. I hope there might be time for further analysis of the impact of the numerous and far reaching changes in this proposed legislation so that people like me can continue to deliver good customer service and the best of governments to San Franciscans. Thank you very much. Thank you, caller. Thank you. Please stand by. Welcome caller, your three minutes begins now. 
Good morning, commissioners. My name is Charles Head. I'm the president of the Coalition for San Francisco Neighborhoods, Coalition for Neighborhoods, not just of some neighborhoods. Uh, we are very much in favor of uh, this um, ballot measure. Um, I understand the people have concerns. These are minutia meant to delay. We need to address the 800-pound um, gorilla in the room. The mayor does not want this, um, this uh, ballot measure. The mayor does not want independent commissions putting things on the ballot. The mayor does not want independent board of supervisors putting things on the ballot. The mayor wants to rule by the mayor's whim. And this is something that needs to be addressed in your deliberations, but it's something that um, impe impels us to proceed ASAP. We can't let the good be the, uh, excuse me, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We need this ballot measure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Please stand by. Welcome, caller. Your three minutes begins now. Uh, hello, my name is uh, John Calden. I'm the managing director of the War Memorial Department. Uh, and I want to thank Ethics Commission staff and Ethics Commissioners for uh, their diligence and their commitment uh, to trying to solve the, the real problems that face the city. Um, I, I would like to make uh, sort of two comments. Uh, one is just regarding process. I do think we need to give some breathing room to this entire process because uh, it isn't really a wholesale and, and sweeping overhaul of ethics uh, rules. And, and while I understand some commissioners desire to have it on the June ballot, that's sort of a false deadline. Uh, we should get this right and, and not get it fast. It's really important uh, that that process be adhered to and that the Ethics Commission set a high standard for that process um, uh, and take its time working with, with the community partners. Um, uh, regarding the substance of uh, the measure itself, I agree with the previous caller that we need to address the 800 pound gorilla in the room, which is bribery. I mean, it's quite clear that Mohammed Nuru and his other uh, folks were, were engaged in bribery. And I think uh, the parts of the ballot measure that address that are quite smart. Um, the parts about restricted source and all of that, are really a regulatory thicket that um, will, will scare people and have a chilling effect without actually, I think, making any change. The other uh, issue with the ballot measure and, and, and how I don't think it's actually addressing the root problem um, is that, you know, clearly timely and effective oversight is necessary uh, for effective regulation. And, uh, you know, at the October meeting of this commission, some commissioners expressed exasperation uh, with with the timeliness of oversight from Ethics Commission staff, uh, namely regarding uh, former Supervisor Fewer's um, stipulated agreement regarding a campaign finance violation that took five years to work its way through the commission. Now, I'm not implying that Ethics Commission staff aren't working really hard and diligently uh, having engaged with them over this process. They certainly are, but they might be under-resourced, um, and, and that's something this ballot measure can address. So I think if we're really trying to solve the actual problem, then keeping the bribery component and looking at the resources Ethics Commission staff has to engage in timely and effective oversight uh, would solve that problem. The restricted source items, the ticket items, all of those other items uh, really are just sort of a scattershot approach to something that isn't the problem we're actually addressing. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Please stand by. Thank you, caller. Your three minutes begins now. Good morning. My name is Denny Machuka Grieb. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the public information officer for San Francisco's Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing. HSH is committed to transparency, especially in relation to any philanthropic funding or gifts the department receives. The proposed ballot measure would make it difficult for our department to build meaningful relationships and explore opportunities for partnership with philanthropic and private organizations who are crucial partners in addressing the homelessness crisis. Philanthropic and private partners, as well as small nonprofits, especially those that work with vulnerable and marginalized communities, are already wary of working with the city. Adding more bureaucratic barriers 
and overbroad, unreasonable, and vague requirements would further dissuade partners from coming to the table to work with local government. This legislation proposes to build walls when we should be building bridges. HSH is committed to continuing the work with all of our city partners to adhere to ethical practices that support transparency, ac accountability, and partnerships. HSH would like the opportunity to participate in an authentic dialogue around this legislation and hope the commission will consider providing the opportunity for dialogue and feedback from city partners and the public before advancing this legislation further. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, moderator, Do you know how many people um, on the queue waiting to speak because we, it's now approaching noon and some yeah. of us may need a bathroom break? Yeah, we currently have one, one, two, three more. Okay. 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 Please stand by. Welcome, caller. Your three minutes begins now. Good morning, commissioners. I am Lisa Pagan, Director of Policy and Planning at the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Our department has conducted an initial review of the proposed a ballot measure as originally shared um, for us those amendments were, were quite sweeping um, but given that there's additional discussions around uh, other amendments of the department and through the um, meet and confer process we do need more time to work with our stakeholders all of our stakeholders would be restricted sources all of our businesses seek permits with the city have permits with the city um, many of the permits that we do including legacy business certifications are not ministerial even though they you know probably shouldn't fall under this so there's a lot um, of, of questions we're putting together that we will be submitting to the commission um, it was challenging with Omicron and our staffing and the holidays um, to really put together something comprehensive, but we are working on that and, and that will be forthcoming. So I thank you for your time. And I do um, think we should have false timelines related to this and just take the time that's needed for us all to understand um, the impact. Thank you again. Take care. Thank you, caller. Thank you. Please stand by. Welcome caller, your three minutes begins now. Hello, Ethics Commissioners. This is Jessica Lehman. I'm the Executive Director of Senior and Disability Action. Uh, we are a small nonprofit that does community organizing around housing, healthcare, other issues. And um, I just recently heard about this proposed legislation and we share a lot of the concerns um, about the impact on community organizations like ours, especially small ones, um, which are also more likely to be led by um, black people and people of color, um, LGBTQ people, people from other marginalized groups. So I think this is really an equity issue to make sure that, um, that we are not setting up um, groups from marginalized communities for unintentionally violating the law and being hit with big penalties. Um, you know, for starters, it's hard to understand. I've been trying to look at the legislation. It's more than hundred pages. Um, it's it's a lot, and I really urge you to to take more time. This doesn't need to happen for June. Um, at least, you know, a lot of these things that that affect um, city contracting organizations. Um, my own experience is that Senior in Disability Action um, has gotten contracts from the Department of Disability and Aging Services and a couple other city departments, and so we work with staff at that department a lot. Um, you know, we have program analysts that we've met with multiple times a year for many years. Um, we also work with people on coalitions, like working on reframing aging, right? And so we get to know people, we share values in terms of wanting to improve lives of seniors and people with disabilities. Um, and, and so I become friends with some of them, right? And there are a lot of people in, um, in city departments that have come from community groups, right? So there's someone in particular, I'm thinking of who I was friends with, you know, we go out for a drink, 
Um, and then she, she gets hired by the department. Does that mean when we go out for drinks, do I have to be wary of, can I not, you know, pay for her drink? Can I buy her a birthday present? Right. And, and I don't know the answers to these questions. Like maybe it's in there. That's part of, of like, I, I don't understand all the, the details, but, um, but it certainly makes me really nervous. Um, and then from, um, with senior and disability action, we do an annual celebration every year. That's our big grassroots fundraiser. And a lot of um, staff from that department attend because it's a time to see what they're, what we're doing and they care about the work we're doing. And so sometimes they buy tickets. Sometimes we offer tickets, um, you know, it's a fundraiser. So there are tickets. And so, um, so that sounds like that could be an issue as well as, is what does that look like? So these are just some of the, the concerns. Um, and, you know, of course we all share the, the desire to make sure that things are fair and that people are not violating ethics in general. Um, but Your three minutes um, has expired. Wanted... Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by. Welcome caller, your three minutes begins now. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Mayling Green. I have lived in San Francisco for about 20 years now and I've worked for the city for about 14. Um, I'm one of those people who came here, smelled the air and come up with this town. And I love the work I get to do because every day I get to help improve things. I, I get to see how my hands have helped make things better. And it makes me feel like this city, like my community belongs to me as much as I belong to it. Uh, as part of, my, part of my work, I manage the community gardens program for Reckon Park. Um, again, I do this love, this work because I believe in the power of community building and I wanna make my home better for myself and my neighbors, all of us working together. Um, before COVID, we'd often have events in the community gardens where our garden members would bring culturally important foods to share with their neighbors. Um, our community is sharing culture through sharing food. I, um, I hold responsibility for part of the permit review and also for community safety at these events. So, so I've got to be there. And if I'm there and a Chinese grandma is trying to offer me a bun and I'm refusing it, I'm going to offend her. And I'm Chinese. I don't, I don't want to offend my elders. If another garden member has made a tortilla and is offering it to me and I, I have to refuse that, I, I run the risk of eroding broader community trust. Um, because I see myself as a fellow community member, I usually bring something that I make at home to share at the potluck. So can you imagine if I'm standing there and I refuse to eat anything except for the cake I made at home? Like, how is it gonna look for the people that I'm trying to build trust with? They're gonna think that I'm judging their food or their cultures or, or that I don't trust them. And if they think I don't trust them, they're not going to be as open and clear with me and it'll be harder for me to do my job. Um, I know the squeakiest wheel isn't always the neediest wheel, but the people who know how to come and find us um, um, aren't, are always usually better resourced than the ones that we are going out to meet. Um, uh, as other speakers have highlighted, the language in this legislation that's not clear it's not easy to understand. I do want to do the right thing. And I urge you to consider how our city workers are also community members and ensure this legislation focuses on its purpose and doesn't have a negative impact on all of the ways that we participate in civic engagement. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Please stand by. Madam Chair, there are no further callers in the queue. Hey, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the public comment uh, period is closed. Uh, since we are approaching noon, I suggest that we take a 15 minute break and come back at 11.55 to continue this agenda item. If there's no um, opposition, let's see to recess.
Thank you all.
Okay, it looks like we are waiting on Chair Lee. Ah. Hi. Chair Lee, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, Thank great. You. Is everyone back? Okay. Um, we are continuing with today's agenda item number six. Um, do we have any hands up from our fellow commissioners? Want to make comments? Madam Chair, I think Deputy City Attorney Shen wanted to address the, the meeting. Okay. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Penlev. Um, Chair Lee, if you don't mind, I just want to briefly address uh, a comment that was made by Mr. Plainhold during our last um, okay. set of public comment on this item. Uh, okay. Just very, very briefly, I do just want to clarify for the purpose of the record and for the purpose of the commissioners um, that I, I don't believe Commissioner Finlev's comment was improper. Uh, he did let Ms. Lerman, I believe that was the speaker, complete her comment in total before making any comment. So he did not inter interrupt public comment. And likewise, I did not understand that he was trying to elevate Ms. Lerman's comment above any other person's. I think he was just simply noting for staff there was an issue that he wanted to have further dialogue about. Um, and obviously, Ms. Lerman and others will certainly have further opportunities to provide public comment on this legislation as it moves forward. Because for the reasons that we discussed, it's not going to be concluded today. Thank you very much. Okay. And also, I'd like to um, ask um, WCV attorney. My understanding is the public can comment on each and every agenda item. So one person can speak once or 10 times, and that is the public's right to speak, right? So we cannot limit them to just one comment. That, right. that is correct as well, Chair Lee. Uh, so on every single okay. agenda, item, uh, any member of the public has the opportunity to provide public comment. And as you know, during ethics commission meetings, we also provide two opportunities for general public comment as well. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And let's make sure that the record reflects that as well. Um, Commissioner Chu, can I have that? Uh, yeah, yeah, just to clarify uh, regarding public comment, uh, every member of the public has the opportunity to comment on every agenda item on the agenda. However, they can only comment once per agenda item. Yes. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. if, if, I'm, if I may, Charlie, so what is strictly required is that everyone has an equal opportunity. So if, if everyone gets one chance of public comment, then everyone gets the same chance for the same amount of time for every set of public comment. Theoretically, the commission could allow for multiple rounds of public comment on a single agenda item. And if so, that those multiple rounds need to be extended to every single person in the public. So this is not strictly required to just one. What's most important is that it is equal. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And also, if one person is allowed more than three minutes, everyone else would be afforded the same opportunity, unless that person needs language assistance. Right. That is correct as well, Charlie. Thank okay. you for the clarification. Thank you for the clarification. Um, I also want to thank the public for the comments. Um, after the past two years, I think uh, um, we all agree um, that we need to foster um, public trust that San Francisco is um, really committed to a healthy, sustainable, accountable, ethical, open government. Uh, I think what the agenda item appearing before us and the previous uh, meetings really show that this commission is taking its um, uh, directive very, very seriously. And staff has worked very, very diligently and hard to achieve what uh, the public expects of us and expects of the city government. Uh, it is a very serious matter. It's a very important matter. And I think that we need to do this uh, diligently and carefully, and that's why, uh, uh, you know,
know, we're having these discussions and these inputs are welcomed. For me, um, I know that we all want to get to a, a place that we can all uh, have a voice. And that's why March 4th, um, as the Deputy City Attorney has reminded us, is a very critical date um, uh, for us to really uh, be mindful of. But at the same time, uh, we want to make sure that this process is transparent, open, inclusive, uh, especially um, for those who are uh, in the forefront. And it is uh, troubling for me to hear um, several of the callers who are representing community-based organizations because they are the, the folks in the front line between uh, the government as well as the communities that uh, they serve and, and we, uh, we answer to. So um, since there were several comments made um, from the nonprofit sector, I would uh, like to ask the director if um, she would want to uh, uh, respond either today at, at or at a future uh, meeting. Uh, there's also another suggestion uh, that, uh, you know, that there could be a co-session to provide uh, more information to help uh, the commission understand the, the current meet and confer process. Um, I would like to participate if that is the only option available. But my question first is to the deputy city attorney. Is uh, Director Eisen's offer uh, still stands? Does the three member rule apply, which means that not more than three of us could participate in this um, um, closed session meetings because I think that all of us um, may want to participate. So that's the question for the Deputy City Attorney um, Shen. The second question I have, or not question, is a um, uh, question to the Executive Director, uh, tell him, um, given the, the um, timeline that we have, I would suggest that we put this item on the January 21st meeting um, in the hope that we can uh, have uh, um, uh, more information to move this forward. So if we can put that on the next Friday's agenda item, um, just to meet the, the um, public notice uh, requirement. So my, I have three questions. Number one, uh, to Director Eisen, is the offer still stand? If that is the case, then to Deputy City Attorney um, Shen, um, does this qualify under, you know, our three-person rule, can all five of us participate if we want to? And third, and, and definitely not the, the um, least is if Alyssa Palin wants to respond to some of those um, comments made uh, during public session, either today or the future day. Uh, Chair Lee, maybe I can answer that question uh, first. Um, I'll, I'm happy to turn over. I think we have just a, maybe have some brief comments. Uh, I'll share with, uh, ask Michael and, and Pat to share just for uh, accuracy for the record uh, for purposes of today's meeting. Um, but yes, as to next week's meeting, we can certainly add a closed session item if that's the commission's preference. Uh, uh, and again, if, if Ms. Eisen or her staff are available, but we, we can certainly add that to the agenda that we post uh, later today. Okay. Okay. Director Eisen, I assume the offer is still on the table? Yeah, of course. We're happy to brief the commission uh, on providing negotiations update. I will say uh, 
given our uh, schedule that I know that we have next Friday, I would re respectfully request that the closed session be scheduled first uh, so that we can be heard first and um, if that's possible, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chair Lee, I have a question if I may for um, uh, Ms. Eisen. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, one of the uh, callers had su suggested that uh, the commission would be able to obtain a list of topics discussed um, uh, or addressed, discussed, and resolved. Uh, not the not the positions of the parties, but um, uh, just the issues uh, that are um, at issue. Is that possible for us to receive that in advance of the closed session briefing next week? I'm happy to report in the closed session. I'm not. I would not be able to disclose uh, in a. Uh, I I can follow up our uh, closed session with uh, confidential written materials if needed, and I can discuss it in detail in closed session next week. Um, I just have to uh, let this commission know, and uh, this speaks to Commissioner Bush's comments. We also consider this a matter of urgency. We are very engaged with it. Um, we, just so this commission can put it into context, we are um, at the fulcrum as an agency in employee response to the COVID emergency, we dispatch all the disaster service workers, we're deeply involved in continuity of critical services in the city, we're engaged in numerous meet and confers around various policies that affected all of that. So we are stretched quite thin. Um, I am going to give this all in full uh, due consideration. I know it is an urgent matter for this commission and we will do our full due diligence to give you a complete report. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to ask the, I want to check in with Commissioner Bush. I don't see, oh, Commissioner Bush, if we were to move this to the top of the agenda, um, you had mentioned that you had wanted a later start. Will you be able to participate? Yes. If the closed session is on agenda item number one, Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, now, excuse me, when we do that, it will be for more than just a briefing on the meet and confer from uh, Ms. Eisen, but we could also uh, consider other aspects related to the budget, to the ballot measure. Is that correct? Yes. Because the closed session is a separate item. All right, thank you. Okay, um, any further discussions? Yeah, yeah. Let me, if I might, Charlie, if I might ask Michael uh, Canning or or Andrew Pat Ford to, to comment briefly uh, okay. about your earlier question. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, thank you, Dr. Palm. Um, just, just wanted to correct a couple of uh, issues that came up during public comment. Um, uh, the first of which is that um, uh, the proposal does not contain any additional reporting requirements for nonprofits. Uh, I heard that come up a couple of times and uh, not sure what that is referencing, but there are no additional um, nonprofit reporting uh, requirements in the, the measure. Um, this measure would also not stop nonprofits from uh, partnering with departments via grant arrangements or other contracts. Uh, it really only says that the director um, or officer of a nonprofit uh, that is a party to a contract with the state department is unable to give gifts to officials within that department. Uh, so that that's the uh, restriction that uh, would be on nonprofits or nonprofit uh, officers and directors. Um, and we've also uh, already proposed an exception um, to for free attendance at nonprofit fundraisers, which is uh, in that letter that's attachment three to today's agenda, uh, today's agenda item. Um, as, as long as attendance at those nonprofit fundraisers is a necessary part of the city officials' duties, uh, and there's a similar exception uh, proposed for 
um, attendance at arts uh, events that are also a necessary part of uh, city duties. Um, and also this would not be a prohibition on you know, stopping or, or attempt to stop departments from getting non-city funding um, or in, uh, funding from, from nonprofits or other non-city entities. Um, this speaks to the, to the disclosure element of it, which is on the department side, which is a consolidation of existing disclosures. Uh, currently, uh, outside payments to city departments are required to be disclosed in three places, uh, to the controller's office, to the board of supervisors, and publicly via the Sunshine Ordinance. Uh, what this measure would do would be to create a, a single disclosure that would hopefully meet the requirements of all three of those existing disclosures. Uh, so thereby lowering the total amount of reporting that would be required when outside payments do, do come in. Um, and there's also a reference to uh, attendance at conferences and there's already a uh, gift exception in place uh, for conference attendance. Um, so those are just a few of the things that stood out that we wanted to uh, briefly correct for the record today. Thank you. I think there's also a reference regarding um, uh, public events uh, where food is served to everybody. Yeah, I heard that one as well. Um, it sounds like that would be a, a public event that's freely available to the public, in which case that would not be considered a gift either. If it's something that's open to members of the public, a city official could go and uh, enjoy that benefit without fear of it being considered a gift. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Kenny. Commissioner Chu, your hands up. Yes, thank you, Chair Lee. Uh, I'd just like to observe that um, I think cor corruption has flourished in San Francisco, and it took the federal government uh, investigators and the FBI to bring it to light and to bring indictments and uh, guilty pleas. And so the, I, I think that it is incumbent upon all of us, not just this commission, but um, the uh, community, um, the regulated community, uh, uh, from whom we heard today, uh, to act with all deliberate speed to uh, enact in, in, in measures uh, intended to address the culture and the problematic behavior that uh, are at the heart of uh, a lot of the allegations and uh, guilty pleas that we have seen come through. And the March 4th deadline it gives us time to continue the meet and confer process. But the city and people of San Francisco have been waiting since January of 2020 to see some action in this regard. Uh, two years ago this month is when the indictment of Mohamed Nuru became public. And if we are if we wait until the November ballot deadline, any any uh, any additional uh, action, it will be deferred until January of 2023, a year from now. I don't think that the city of and um, residents of San Francisco should have to wait that long. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Chu. I, I want to connect my myself to your uh, comment. Um, Commissioner Bush. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes, I want to associate myself with those comments very definitely. And I also would like to add that I think that the staff has done a very good job in outlining what the issues are and how we plan to respond to them. And that that information was provided on the web page and in other forms. Uh, and so the complaints that are being voiced that people were unaware of this has to do with their lack of due diligence, not ours. And so I'd like to just point out that we are doing our job of bringing out information to the public in a timely manner for their consideration. And if they didn't take the opportunity to do that, that's not our problem. That's their problem. And they probably need to talk to themselves about what's going on. Also, I'm troubled by the fact that we have contractors and grantees of city departments that are showing up to to, to uh, voice their concerns about these things when in fact, they're really not affected by this. And 
Thirdly, I'd like to point out that the controller has just completed a report that came out two days ago showing that the city departments are not tracking the community benefits awards that are part of uh, the process of elevating a uh, contractor above other contractors. In fact, some 70% of some of the contracts are, are, are awarded with uh, a contingency of community benefits and that the community benefits are not tracked and are not being met. And that's just at Rec and Park. It doesn't talk about the same kind of things are going on at planning and elsewhere. So when I hear the departments are doing a great job and that they are on the front lines of protecting the city against corruption and then see the controller's own reports less than 72 hours ago, I don't understand how that complaint, how that claim can stand up to scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bush. Commissioner Bell? Unmute, please. Well, thank you so much. Um, I am somewhere um, not as far down the road as my colleagues are on this um, in terms of my um, feeling sure about where I am on this. <clears throat> I understand um, the, the comments by my colleagues about how long this has taken. Um, and so where, 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 the, where the road is becoming difficult for me is, where is it that um, I don't understand is a proxy for I really don't agree? Or where is I don't understand, I really don't understand because this is complicated. And so I just think that I would want to make sure that um, when Mr. Canning came back and said, um, these were the comments, these are how we've addressed them, that we make sure that um, folks understand if they are not implicated by these um, rules, that they understand that and therefore are not opposing them, as Commissioner Bush suggests that that they are not um, in um, in line in this regard. So I guess I am that I would want to make sure that we take the time to be clear about what we what we are doing and not doing, and that people in community based organizations and people that are concerned about equity know what those clear lines are. Um, and that we do what we can to make that happen, understanding that with something like this, it's not going to be, um, um, you know, there's going to be significant disagreement across the board. And so, for example, like um, when Commissioner Chu was talking about, um, and Mr. Canning was talking about gifts, do we all understand what those mean, even if there's a definition? Is it that we can speak about this in ways in which people that may be implicated understand, oh, no, that isn't that isn't a gift. If I'm having this or if I go to that and I can't give this, that we are able to, as best we can, have those um, explanations. So I would leave it there and understand the, the balance between getting a broader understanding and therefore more support versus everybody's not going to understand everything and we can't keep delaying until everybody feels totally comfortable with where we are um, and understanding that balance. And I just think that um, I would just want to make sure that we have done what we can. And as Commissioner Bush suggests, we have done a ton um, to make sure that the thrust of the legislation is understood by the parties um, uh, that are liable to be most impacted. Uh, and I'll leave Thank it you. there. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bell. Um, I think Commissioner I've done my... Bell. 
Yeah, you're <laughs> off screen, so my apologies. That's okay, Madam Chair, thank you. I want to thank Commissioner uh, Bell for those comments and I, I want to echo them. I think we've had great public engagement today. It's really nice to hear from the, the nonprofits and the departments. I empathize with staff who I think have done everything correctly. They had interested persons meetings, they had the MEA process, and they're probably thinking, where were these folks months ago? And I sympathize with Mr. Or Commissioner Bush's comments that it sounds like the MEA kind of uh, blew us off. That said, I don't think we build public trust by cutting off basically public comment because folks didn't respond when they should have. The fact is that now folks seem to be engaged and I think we need to hear those concerns. I think like Commissioner Bell said, a lot of those concerns may be unfounded. I heard a lot of comments from entities that think this proposal will chill their activities. I frankly don't see how it would, but I would like to understand what their concerns are. Given my read of the ballot measure, I don't see how it would chill anyone's civic participation, but that's me sitting here. I think we owe it to the public to make sure we understand what the concerns are, to give them an opportunity to be specific. Through the MEA process, through the closed session, I think we'll hear some of that from the department heads, but we won't hear it from the nonprofits. As I understand it, they're not part of that process. They're not city employees. Um, they're not city. If I'm wrong, someone hopefully will correct me, but I don't think we're gonna hear from them through that MEA process, to the extent their representatives are listening, I would urge them to write in letters if that's what it, if that's the best way to make your specific comments known to the commission. I've heard a lot of concerns that are kind of vague about chilling participation, but I don't know what that means. They may not be founded, but I think we need to, to make sure that we know what they are. As Chair Lee said, this is all about public trust. I think we, uh, we don't get there by not giving folks a real opportunity to be heard, even though they probably could have been heard months ago and weren't. The fact is now folks seem to be engaged. Uh, so I very much welcome the closed session. I welcome any comments by folks who are not part of the MEA process to make your concerns directly and specifically known to the commission. Great, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I have to I think uh, an ongoing uh, frustration that I have is uh, no matter what kind of outreach, what kind of engagement the staff has uh, put up, it's always with a um, limited universe of stakeholders. Um, whether people were not paying attention or we were not doing our due diligence in reaching out to the broader newer communities, and you're right, usually by the time they hear about it, they probably heard it secondhand uh, near the deadline because after all, their primary mission is to serve their community um, with very limited resources. So I do feel, I do um, welcome the comments from our uh, CBOs and our community service organizations and, and and uh, they do have the concerns. And whether uh, whether they're right or wrong, um, they work with the community. So I'm glad that they call in. And what I would like to ask the staff to do is continue to do the outreach, but not just the, you know, typical, uh, um, uh, outreach, but between now and next week, put together a FAQ, answer the specific questions that were raised today, uh, frequently asked questions, in a very short, succinct, uh, um, succinct way that a nonprofit executive director will take one minute to understand, ah, my concern was not founded. Um, including that with the general um, mission, why we are doing this and why this would not impact them. In fact, you know, it, it may um, uh, help them so that everybody is, is on the same page. I know the urgency and I really, really hope that we can get this done because as Commissioner Chu said, it's been over two years. Um, my friends in DC 
tease me constantly that they would read about, you know, San Francisco scandal for the day, you know, from Wall Street and Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, whatever. Um, who knows what more is going to come up? So right now we have two challenges. One is we still need to meet the the March 4th deadline. I think that we are committed, uh, and the city uh, public expects that. So if we can address the concerns that was raised uh, by today's um, commenters, get the FAQs out. Maybe, you know, it's so simple. Based on what Mr. Kenning had said earlier today, put that out in the web, uh, in our website, and also reach out to the couple of the nonprofit um, organization leaders who have spoken today to see if we can put together a Zoom call that they could bring together the network, whether it's the health network, um, uh, senior network, you know, talking network, whatever, as many people as they can let information uh, out there, answer any questions that they may have, but more importantly, you speak directly, or the commission speaks directly to uh, this very, very vital um, partner um, uh, that we have in this, you know, in this um, uh, movement, so to speak. So uh, I know that this will be on the agenda item, uh, on the agenda for next Friday, but between now and next Friday, I understand Monday is a holiday, but put together something very, very basic to respond to these folks who had questions. And then hopefully we will be able to, um, you know, uh, continue on the same page. Transparency is key. We need to do this. And, you know, whether the, uh, um, uh, the staff can do it today or Tuesday, we need to get these things done. Because if one segment of our community is still informed, this is not going to get through. And and we will continue to be having this discussion five years, 10 years from now. And the FBI will be continuing to investigate us. So. Um, Chair Lee. Chair Lee. I didn't see anybody. Me. Oh, Commissioner Bush, please, sorry. I'd, I'd like to ask the partners that we are dealing with, department heads and others, if they could provide us with examples of uh, penalties that they have exacted against people in their departments for failing to uh, comply with existing rules, such as filing on time for Form 700, filing complete form 700s. How many times have they actually acted to uh, penalize department heads or department staff who report to them? As well as when they have been informed that uh, uh, something is wrong that needed to be corrected, whether they have been acted to make the correction. Because I know in the past we've seen department heads who refused to act when commissioners would act to interfere in the hiring process to see that a relative was hired. And they were well aware of it. It was certainly in the newspapers and they just declined to act. And we have other examples. That's just a very telling one. So I'd like to, them to provide us with information since they're talking about the fact that they are doing a good job already, what does that good job consist of? And I think that will help build public trust as well in their departments. Uh, the extent to which they are monitoring the uh, community benefits that are part of a winning contract, whether it's following up on what the controller has just issued with regards to Rec and Park, or whether it's planning or anyone else. Thirdly, I'd like them to explain whether the 
proposed rules apply to city unions that have separate agreements outside of MEA, like the police have a police bill of rights. Uh, and I'm not sure to what extent our proposals meet up against the police bill of rights. For example, one of the things in our proposal is when officers or when city employees misrepresent information in the course of an investigation. And we've certainly seen examples from the public defender's office of police who have misrepresented information. So is that covered by our stuff or is that not covered by us? So as you can see, where I'm going with this is that we have obligations on both sides, not just our side. Our side is correct that uh, Commissioner Finlay has said, we need to be clear what the problems are and whether we have addressed them or if we have decided that those are not problems that we are going to address and move on because you can do that in the meet and confer process. Or whether these are issues that are essentially created to delay or kill action by ethics because they don't like the concept of where we're going. Or thirdly, whether they're trying to hide what it is that they're not doing and making outsized claims of what they are doing rather than actually showing us what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Since staff has recommended no actions be taken on this agenda item, um, if we have no more comments, let's move to agenda item number seven. Um, that was the item. Thank you very much for coming and we look forward to the uh, session with you next Friday. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay. Agenda item number seven, discussion of the executive director's report. Director Pellum? Yes. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Lee and, and members. There are a number of reports that I wanted to provide this month as we start uh, another busy year at the commission. Um, we uh, of course wanted to again, welcome our newest commissioner uh, Finlove and very much uh, look forward to uh, providing additional sessions to drill down into the, the work that we do, uh, including uh, procedural items that we handle at commission meetings. So uh, my, my apologies for not having that done, uh, done sooner before today to, to you, Commissioner Finlove, sorry for the confusion and we will look forward to working with you more uh, to, to provide the briefing as, as fully as possible to avoid confusion in the future. Um, I also wanted to let you know that we have now posted our ethics at work, pro, uh, ethics at work uh, training and outreach program manager position on our job page. And so we are accepting applications for that. We are working to finalize the job application uh, announcements for the three remaining positions. Uh, one would be a technology focused position, two others would be uh, training and outreach uh, communication specialists. So we're looking forward to having those posted in, uh, in the coming days. Uh, as we reported last month, we were on track and have now uh, launched our Form 700 e-filing project for all city uh, code designated filers. Uh, this is a project that uh, you know we, we stopped for a moment to celebrate the success of the January date having arrived, but we know the work will continue over the coming months as we lead into the first annual filing period in which all uh, conflict of interest code designated filers in the city will be filing their uh, statements of economic interest for the first time in an electronic format to make it publicly accessible and 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 help them easily more easily hopefully comply with that requirement. So we're excited about that launch and to remain on track working with our departmental colleagues uh, on that front. Uh, there, I, I think we still have our policy team here on, on tap if you have questions further, but as you see, there's a new behested payments law that takes effect on January uh, 23rd and we are preparing communications to send out to, to help people understand <laughs> excuse me, um, that, that new, what that new provisions or that new uh, law would require. Uh, I think your points in the last conversation are very well taken and we will be working on the FAQ and materials to try and provide as much succinct information as we can. We'll endeavor to do the same thing on this because we know there has been a lot of discussion over the past year about this, uh, but that new law does take effect on January 23rd. Um, I also provided a, a 
information on updates on our uh, changes that seem to happen fairly quickly over the last month in terms of our on-site presence due to the growing uh, presence of Omicron and uh, the city's uh, guidance to maximize telework for all staff. So as you know, we have temporarily closed our offices for physical visits. Uh, we are still providing uh, services quite uh, robustly on online through phone calls and through emails uh, with individuals. Uh, and we are seeing some movement uh, about on-site resumption of commission meetings, policy body meetings, uh, and the latest um, um, information that we have is that the city has been targeting February 28th to be the date on which policy bodies will start meeting back in City Hall. Uh, that is information that uh, may be subject to change depending on what's happening with the prevalence in the community uh, on Omicron. Uh, but we are working and have started meeting with other policy bodies to make sure that we are aware of the logistics uh, and any uh, support that we may need to provide you and the public for how those meetings will begin to work in a, in a back uh, when we resume on-site uh, commission meetings uh, in the coming uh, months or so. Um, I've also attached to this report two uh, more substantive items and staff are on hand if you have any questions, but uh, one was an overview of some of the case data that we've been looking at over the last six months into the whistleblower program activity. I know there's been some interest on the part of the commission to take a look at that. Uh, we provided that, that data and some observations and uh, some thoughts on how we're using that data to inform our ongoing whistleblower uh, investigative activity. Um, and so we, uh, we wanted to share that with you. We will of course continue to report in our annual report about a more in-depth information from the course of the year. Uh, but really it's that we, we're seeing, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're instituting practices so that we can regularly uh, look at the, the investigations we're conducting, the kinds of issues we're finding, so that that also helps inform our ethics at work outreach going forward. Um, separately, I provided uh, with the audit team uh, an update on the lobbying audits. Uh, we are now in the implementation phase. Uh, once the January 15th lobbying audit uh, disclosure reports are filed, uh, the team will be using that to pull uh, the selection of the uh, audits to be um, conducted in the coming months. And um, we will be um, you know, happy to provide further information about that. Uh, the slides here were to, to give you a sense of the work that's gone into the uh, process of uh, planning uh, the audit work and uh, rough timeframes for what we anticipate over the coming months for that work to continue in the implementation phase. I think two last items um, to note, uh, as you know, we, ha we do have our meeting next week, uh, the first of our public hearings on departmental budget priorities for fiscal year 23 that starts uh, July 1st of this year. Uh, the mayor issued departmental instructions to departments uh, for it, it, on December 14th, uh, due to the um, budget surplus that they are, the city has seen, which is over $100 million uh, in surplus at this time, the mayor is not asking for departments to present any cuts. Uh, the mayor has asked uh, departments to retain uh, their work within existing budget levels. Uh, but in any event, you will see uh, our agenda posted with materials uh, later today, so that you and the public will have access to that information for the public hearing next week. So next week's commission meeting will involve both a, a hearing on um, the potential or the uh, budget uh, priorities, uh, the closed session item that you uh, asked for uh, earlier in, in the last item, and uh, any other of the regular items that we have for, for meetings uh, such as that. There is a uh, back, I guess I should re retrace my steps for just a moment on some hiring news. Uh, we do, uh, after it was, I was uh, not, not able to get this into our, uh, this month's executive director's report, but I do have some good news to share on the hiring front. And that is that we have completed our process for the hiring of our new enforcement director. Uh, our new enforcement director will take effect, uh, take uh, assume that those those duties on February 7th. And I'm very pleased to announce that our new new enforcement director will be Pat Ford whom you've come to know very well uh, as our uh, Senior Policy and Legislative Affairs Council. Pat has, uh, I think, a, a, a extensive uh, well of experience to draw upon in this new role, uh, has been a, a go-to person on, uh, on a lot of matters to help us wade through policy and to be thoughtful about our new processes. Uh, we're delighted that he's stepping into this new role. Um, 
So we will be, you'll be, you'll be hearing from Pat in the coming months in a different capacity. Um, we, Pat will obviously be playing a key role with Michael in continuing to see this uh, policy, major policy work effort through. And as we'll talk about in the budget uh, documents that you'll, in the commission meeting next week, we'll talk about some of the thoughts we have about um, how we get through uh, uh, work that we have in front of us with the policy team of two. Um, but for right now, uh, we also uh, will just acknowledge that we know that uh, we have a very strong uh, Michael Canning who's who will be continuing our work in this area. And um, we will obviously uh, need to juggle and do as best we can um, until we are able to sort of fully staff that unit. But I just wanted to acknowledge and congratulate um, and let and introduce you to, to Pat in his new capacity, which will be starting next month. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them for me. Very happy news. Uh, congratulations, Mr. Ford, Director Ford. Um, coming from our fellow commissioners, first Commissioner Bell, then Commissioner Seneff, and then Commissioner Bush. Thank you for that report and congratulations out um, to Mr. Ford, um, who has been putting in so much work on this. And I feel that every confidence in his work around enforcement. And um, I just think it is uh, great. So congratulations. I don't have any more to say than that. Short and sweet, okay. Thank you, Commissioner Bell. Uh, I wanna echo that congratulations. Congratulations, Mr. Ford. That's great news. I look forward to, to working with you on enforcement. On that note, I think we have two enforcement vacancies on the website, but I didn't hear them. Uh, doesn't sound like there are open postings for those. Is that just if you could respond to that? But then before you do, unrelatedly, I wanted to just say I just used the electronic Form 700 filing. It was fantastic. It was glitch free. It was easy. Congratulations to the staff that put that together. It used to be a huge pain. Uh, so that's a great innovation. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fenlove, I'm delighted to hear that we had some technology that has been working well this week <laughs> for you. <laughs> Thank you for that feedback. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, yes, a question. The senior investigator positions, they are in uh, what we would describe as the uh, application review phase. Um, the window has closed. We are actively reviewing the applications and hope to be getting more information out to candidates shortly um, that they are active. So uh, we uh, look forward to having uh, more information that, uh, potentially at the, at the February meeting for you on that. But But those are still in play. Thank you. Commissioner Bush. Thank you. Uh, and my congratulations to Pat Ford as well, who has been the go to guy for many of the issues that I've found uh, that I needed answers for. Um, Director Pelham, I have a few questions uh, related to the report that you've done, which are easy questions. This is not a quiz. <laughs> But the uh, the report of breaks out the different elements that you're following, but I didn't see one on public outreach, uh, and I'm concerned that public outreach be elevated uh, to an area as important to us as uh, rewriting the laws and so forth. So uh, a public outreach plan to include targeted audiences, not just the general audience, but uh, based on language, facility with internet searching, the media, community organizations, and including the goals and timetables and outcomes that are being sought. So I'd like, that's an important element, I think, to our work, but I think we need to spell out uh, so that people can see that that's, uh, something that we need to look at. Um, secondly, I'm glad to see that you're doing uh, a lobbyist audit and review. But when I looked at the lobbyist uh, plan uh, that's attached to the uh, document that we got from the commission meeting today, it follows the traditional things of money in and money out but it does not include one of the elements that's required of lawyers, and that's to file what is the outcome that they sought. And the outcome is, of course, the whole point of lobbying is to get a certain outcome. But yet, 
most lobbyists are leaving blank what it is that the outcome is that they seek. And I hope that the review will pinpoint that as an issue and uh, remind lobbyists that that needs to be completed. Uh, I would like to see that expanded just by one area, and that's to say, what is the outcome sought and the value to the client? So that you could say, we're seeking permits for X, Y, and Z developments, which will have a value to the client of blah, blah, blah. And one of the reasons I say that is because we know many times in which a permitted uh, piece of property is then traded away for some other benefits. So that happens a lot on south of uh, market area. Uh, and so I would suggest that we take a look at adding that in addition to having people fill out the uh, 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 the, for what it is the outcome you're seeking. And finally, I'd, I'd note that uh, uh, all lobbyists have to re-register by February 1st. And so I'm hopeful that after the February 1st re-registration, you can just give us a thumbnail sketch of what does that show? How many lobbyists? Is it an increase from prior years? What departments are uh, the primary uh, interest of lobbyists and that kind of thing. You know, as as part of that, um, we ask, uh, we put our provisions to, to ban people from giving gifts or contributions uh, in many cases, specifically targeting the members of a commission that they're lobbying. But San Francisco doesn't operate its approvals in a silo because uh, you might start off with planning and then go to uh, to permit appeals after you've got a planning permit or go on to the assessor's office because you're changing the value of something and so you're going to do that. So. Uh, I would prefer it if what we had was uh, a an approach that looked at city approvals and not just a specific uh, commission. And I don't know what anyone else's views are on that, but my experience is that things move through a number of chairs to get to an, an ultimate outcome. And so I would think that we would want to just cover all of our bases with that. So that's my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Chu. Thank you, Chair Lee. Uh, I wanted to just first congratulate uh, the, the team on the Form 700 e-filing project. I know that was a huge effort and a long one and uh, with, with many challenges and the fact that we are here now in January of 2022 and it's gone live and it has, at least with an N of one, uh, Commissioner Finlov uh, has worked seamlessly and beautifully. Um, so congratulations, really, really terrific work. Uh, and secondly, not least of all, congratulations to Mr. Ford. What um, a well-deserved uh, uh, role. I think you're going to be terrific and look forward to working with you. Uh, in it in the future. I know you're going to bring all of your passion and dedication and brilliance to it. And um, I, I think it's uh, really great for the commission. So congratulations. Great. Thank you all. Uh, let's open up for public comment, please, moderator. Yes, excuse me, Madam Chair. Uh, to, to the attention of all commissioners, if you... Sorry. Sorry. If you I'm sorry, I wanted, if I could have oh. Oh. Um, Chair Lee's indulgence, I have my hand up. I, had to, I just wanted to say one more thing before we went to public comment, if that's possible. Please, please. Yes, um, since this is my next to the last meeting, I just wanted to 
uh, weigh in on something that <clears throat> Commissioner Bush said that um, stimulated um, the, this kind of, I uh, appreciate your indulgence, this, the sentiment that I tried to express earlier around this, the frustration of getting stuff done um, that I feel and also having communities understand um, and, and, and that stuff. And so the, the notion that Commissioner Bush said about outreach um, for Director Pelham, I just think is really important because so many community-based organizations see as their power base, the supervisors that represent them in their district. And I just think it's important for us as an ethics commission to have a presence. We may not have that power, but we should certainly be able to be present for those community-based organizations that feel like um, that um, we, that, that they have a say or that we're hearing um, what they feel so that we in fact um, can get it right. And I think that this is really important for the um, black community, which is shrinking and disappearing in San Francisco um, and, and um, other communities that are feeling um, that they, are, they don't have access to power and that these rules and regulations put them in more of a bind and, and, and strand them either further away from power because they may not understand them. And so this whole outreach piece is something that I've talked about during my short tenure here, is that whatever we, whatever we come up with, it's really important for people to understand it because we want them to understand um, that this isn't something that is out to get them. We heard in the comments that the 800 pound gorilla is the powerful people, but now our rules and regulations are gonna hurt the little person. So I know that that's not what our staff and team is trying to do. And I think it's through an ongoing structured out, um, um, outreach strategy that we can actually hear from people so that we know about this stuff on the front end rather than having to be frustrated dealing with it in the middle and on the back end. So that wasn't as articulated as, as articulate as I wanted it to be, but I did want to associate that I really believe it's important to structure the outreach um, so that we get it, that we, we have understanding at the, more at the beginning than trying to garner understanding and explaining to folk we're on your side at the back end. So I'll leave it there and I thank you for uh, um, giving me a moment to extend the meeting um, with those comments. Thank you, Commissioner Bell. It was perfectly communicated and uh, we heard you. And I think uh, I want to attach uh, myself to your comments. Um, I think that the cities, communities are um, ever changing. Um, and instead of uh, reaching out, we really need to build the trust first. Uh, I think that uh, we need to go out there to introduce ourselves instead of telling them what we're doing. We need to hear from them what we ought to be doing and then move from there. So thank you very much. Um, if we can go to public comments right now, moderator. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. <clears throat> Excuse me. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you've just joined this meeting, we are currently on the public discussion on the motion of agenda item seven, discussion of executive director's report, an update of various programmatic and operational highlights of ethics commission staff activities since the commission's previous meeting. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please stand by. Madam Chair, we have callers in the queue. Okay. Welcome, caller. Your three minutes begins now. So, Commissioners, um, I was listening to the director, and she touched on maybe 30 issues plus. But I want to pick. Uh, I want to pick one issue, so that one of the commissioners who is saying that uh, he's talking about uh, outreach. And I want to um, 
enlightened the, this commissioner and others about this business of outreach. So you have the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission that uh, um, capped uh, the sewer system improvement project to six billion. It is now 12 billion. Think about that. When it was six billion, 5% of that was for outreach, 300 million. Two blacks hated 150 million of that outreach. Juliet Alice for outreach and Dwayne Jones for workforce. Now, I'm going to remind you, it started with 6 billion. It's heading towards 12 billion. I have been investigating this case from 1998 and really delving into it since 2002. I provided the entities that could do the investigation with empirical data, not gossip, empirical data. We have Harlan uh, Kelly indicted. We don't know why Juliet Alice was let scot-free. And we really do not know what is happening to Duane Jones. And I can name 20 or 30 more names, most of them black. I've worked with the Bayview community for 40 years as the director of environmental justice advocacy. The community knows me and I know the community. More in this pandemic, if we had those outreach monies, we could have helped our infants, our children, our elders, mostly black, deal with the pandemic. We should be very cognizant of the fact that corruption in this city is run by a small circle of people, much like the mafia. Your three minutes has expired. Please stand by. Welcome, caller. Your three minutes begins now. Hi, Commissioners. Debbie Lerman for the San Francisco Human Services Network. Uh, first of all, I want to respect uh, fairness and the rules of public, public comment. And I appreciate the call for outreach to CBOs and further opportunity for dialogue around the uh, previous agenda item. And I will look forward to participating and will also submit written comment in advance of the next time this appears on the agenda. Secondly, I wanna comment in general around public engagement. We all do our best to participate. This is a 146 page document on your website. And I will be honest, that I still have not been able to read all of it. So I, I think we're all doing the best we can as CBOs to understand the work of this commission and to participate. And we really do appreciate all the attempts you make at outreach to our sector. I also want to express appreciation for something in the executive director's report, the creation of an ethics outreach and training program that includes city contractors. I've spoken to the need for this type of program for several years. A lot of ethics laws are very complicated and confusing and can result in gotcha situations if somebody doesn't understand them and isn't careful. And city employees do receive ethics training, but contractors that are also subject to several ethics laws are much less likely to be fully aware and versed in the details of these laws. In the past, the Human Services Network has partnered, for example, with the Office of Labor Standards Enforcement to arrange trainings for health and human service nonprofits around labor laws. And we would be more than pleased to assist this commission in any way possible to help our nonprofits 
ensure that they are in compliance with ethics laws as well. So thank you for creating that program. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Please stand by. Madam Chair, there are no further callers in the queue. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now to agenda item number eight, discussion of possible actions for other items for future meetings. Commissioner Bush. Thank you, Chair Lee. I wanted to uh, make sure that it's on record that I'm going to be requesting a, a, a bylaw amendment to allow us to begin meetings at 10 rather than 930 in the future. I know that we're doing that for the next uh, January 21st meeting, but thereafter it's back to 930 and I'm like to give us an opportunity to discuss making that at 10 o'clock. So that's that's one thing I'd like to see on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think one thing that would be helpful would be kind of an enforcement update. I was looking through old minutes and I think previously there may have been obviously nothing confidential, but kind of summaries of enforcement matters, you know, how many are open, uh, what stage are they in? I think it'd be helpful to have an overview of that process. Um, for me as a new commissioner, but probably for, for my colleagues as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Okay, agenda item number nine, additional oh. opportunities for public comments. Chair Lee, did you want to take public comment on agenda item number eight? Oh, thank you for the reminder. You're welcome. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. <coughs> Excuse me. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you just joined this meeting, we are currently on the public discussion on the motion of agenda item number eight, discussion and possible action on items for future meetings. If I've not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please stand by. Madam Chair, we have a caller in the queue. Go ahead, yeah. Thank you, caller. Your three minutes begins uh, now. Okay, okay, got it. Okay. So that's a, uh, Jenny wants to help you. Uh, and yeah, and I, yeah, I Thank you, caller. Your three minutes begins now. I thought that this was done. And uh, so I said, well, listen, if I got to stand in the middle of this, get a phone call. Uh, apparently it looks like that uh, the caller was on another phone call. I did mute them. Um, Madam Chair, there's no further calls, callers in the queue. Commissioner Bush, your hands up. I, I do, uh, because I would like to add to uh, future discussion, a, a discussion of the controller's report on uh, community benefits and whether they're being monitored. That was the report that was com that came out in the last uh, 72 hours, I think it is. And in a close relationship to that is a uh, FPPC report on behested payments that shows a sharp increase in behested payments for government purposes as opposed to nonprofits. And I think it would be good for us to have a briefing on that at the same time as we look at the uh, controller's report. So I, I'm adding those to my request. Thank you. Now, since we have next Friday's meeting uh, specifically to address the budget, right, director? Um, so for the February meeting, um, we would have the bylaw 
um, Volvo uh, contractors report, controllers report, as well as the behest of payment. Uh, and I just want to remind my colleagues that that would be our last meeting to take action on a possible uh, ballot measure. So we need to keep that in mind. Uh, of course, we can add on a new uh, meeting in February as needed. But those are the items that we have uh, uh, before us for the next uh, couple of months, right? Okay. Okay, um, agenda item number nine, additional opportunities for the public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on today's agenda. Please stand by. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you've just joined this meeting, we are currently on the public discussion on the motion of agenda item number nine, additional opportunity for a public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda pursuant to Ethics Commission bylaws, Article 7, Section 2. If you've not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you're online with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please stand by. Madam Chair, we have a caller in the queue. Welcome, caller. Your three minutes begins now. So I want to go back to uh, community benefits. I served in the federal government for a law enforcement agency, as well as six army. I was six army's last congressional liaison, very familiar with the Freedom of Information Act. I am ashamed that this city, when they were given a clear path in an investigation with empirical data, and I'm zeroing in on the controller's office, took all the information and gave it to the city attorney who gave it to somebody that led in the indictment of Holland Kelly and Julia Dallas and some others who are being investigated now. You commissioners, must understand, and you have a judge among y'all, she understands it more than most of y'all. You have another gentleman that I know, he understands it. It's very difficult for the public to go to the Sunshine Task Force and win nine to zero, and yet no action is taken, linked to the Baby Opera House. It's very difficult for the public to go to the controller's office and talk to the head of the controller and the deputy controller and get no results for two years. There are the timelines on the whistleblower. And what y'all do is talk in generalities. We have no leadership. No accountability whatsoever. No transparency. Most important, what I see is that none of y'all can do a needs assessment based on empirical data. Empirical data for 15 years, and y'all cannot resolve a situation that somebody else has to come from outside, take my information, and do the ind indictment. Shame on y'all. And I'm not blaming the Ethics Commission because y'all have no resources. Y'all have no manpower. Y'all had one investigator, and when I was talking, he said, oh, I can't disclose this on the mayor. But all that the mayor did was disclose in the newspaper, and she, had to, she paid a fine of 24000 Your three minutes has expired.
Please stand by. Madam Chair, there's no further callers in the queue. Okay, thank you, moderator. Um, agenda item number 10 is adjournment with no discussion. Uh, I want to thank everybody for your patience and again for so putting up with my tech challenge uh, uh, self. Um, Monday is a holiday, so stay safe and I wish everybody a happy three day weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Happy MLK Day. Thank you, everyone.